let me, let me, let me change the mentality for all the owners listening. You don't want a cold call from the guy three times a day or whatever it is like, but you want him to call you when he's got that hot lead. How does that work? Yeah. Let me tell you how that works out for you. It doesn't. You know who that broker is going to call when he finally digs up that good. He's going to call the owner who was nice to him. He's going to call the owner who allowed him to, to the broker to take him to breakfast. He's going to call the owner who's like, Hey, listen, I don't have anything. I know you call me a lot. Keep doing it. Cause the owner's smart enough to realize, Hey, this guy calls me once a month. Maybe he has the same crappy interest generator. Like, what are your plans? Right. That's bad interest generator, <laughs> you know, but, but I know that that's going to take five minutes, 12 times a year. 16 minutes, that's one hour of my life, 10 years in a row, that's 10 hours of my life. But over the next 10, 10, 10 years, if this guy stays in the business and he sells me one deal, I'm going to make millions on it. And let me tell you, 10 hours to make a million dollars, that's $100,000 an hour. Is that a good return on your time? That's Fuck pretty yeah, good. That's, that's good pretty good. Time. I would take Don't that. Don't ever, ever, ever hang up on a cold caller broker. Yeah. Because you never know who's going to be the great ones. All right, y'all, get your popcorn ready. Uh, I've been chatting with Kyle for the last hour, and today's going to be great. I met Kyle in 2019 uh, in LA. Um, we really haven't chatted a whole lot since then, but um, we've been chatting the last hour, and today's going to be good. So, Kyle, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been pumped. I've uh, been really researching the last couple of days, um, just kind of what you're up to, and you have a really unique story. So let's kind of just start there. How did you kind of grow up and then how did you get to founding Matthews where you are today? How did I grow up like as a kid or in the business? Yeah. Uh, you can take it whichever way you want. Um, well, yeah, I'll tell you my, my story. Cause I, I know it will provide better context for I'm sure questions that come later, but, uh, you know, I grew up, uh, in the Matthews family, the Matthews football family for, for the football fans out there. So my dad's Clay Matthews. He was a linebacker in the NFL for 19 years. You know, uncle's Bruce Matthews, uh, Hall of Fame offensive lineman for 19 years in the NFL. My grandfather played in Damn. the NFL. Um, and then, um, you know, I got into brokerage and I'll, I'll tell that story in a second. And then, you know, I had brothers, uh, who played in the NFL at very high <laughs> levels. I have cousins still in the NFL. What happened, dude? Well, I got all <laughs> the, uh, good looks and intelligence. And so, you know, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, compared to my brothers, that is true. I okay. just want to be clear, but, uh, no, um, it's, uh, it was just a blessing. And, and, um, and so, you know, growing up in that, in that world, in that life, uh, I moved around a lot. You know, I, uh, I, I had a very unique experience where, um, and I've asked my parents why they did that and, and why they did this is we moved every six months. So during the season, my dad uh, played for the Cleveland Browns, go Browns, um, from until I was, from, I was born until I was about 13. Okay. And he played there for 16 years. And then the last uh, three or four years of his career, he, he had played in the Atlanta Falcons. So from, um, from August to de late December, I would live in Cleveland and then at the very end, Atlanta. And then as soon as the last game was over, even if they went to the playoffs, we would move back to LA and I would, you know, we'd kind of move into the same house and many times move to the same school. But so you can imagine like every six months I was getting out of a school and going back to a school. And it was, um, I loved it. It was like, it was always exciting every six months. It was kind of a change of scenery. I, I had two very unique friend groups. And then when I went to Atlanta, a third friend group, sometimes I get dropped into a new school and that was always, uh, you know, it's like I, I did, there were five or six like new school experiences and, um, you know, fast forward to getting into brokerage and sales. I do. I know that helped me, uh, develop the ability to, um, to, you know, develop emotional intelligence. You know, you're just trying to fit in right away, but, uh, but yeah, definitely some sales skills. Cause you got to sell them on why you shouldn't get your ass kicked when, you know, <laughs> when I moved from LA to Georgia in 1993, and it was a little bit of a culture shock at the time. So, um, so, you know, grew up in that family and, uh, there was a lot of spotlight, uh, you know, I'd say from a young age, I, I was always very acutely aware that, um, to some degree, what I said or what I did, you know, people were watching or people were listening, maybe a little more intently to a 10 year old version of me than maybe, you know, someone else. And so, um, so, you know, there are just so many blessings that I receive. There's so, there's just so many, um, uh, development advantages that I, I, in my opinion, I had because of that, that 
that, that experience, that, um, that reality, you know? And so, um, my dad retired when I was a sophomore in high school. And so, you, you know, imagine having your dad playing football when you're in high school, it was, you know, it was a trip and, um, <laughs> and then moved out to LA full time. So, um, I went and played football in high school. I was fortunate enough, uh, to get invited to come play at USC in, um, 2000 was when I graduated high school. And, um, I, I then went to, to SC and play football in my first year. We weren't, we weren't that good. And they made a coaching change and hired a guy named Pete Carroll. If you know that name and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it just like, it was just, it was like a light got turned on, you know, a fire got lit and, um, he came in and had so much energy and so much enthusiasm. Um, you know, people describe him as a player's coach. He was, but he was not a pushover man. We had, they had a killer coaching staff, Norm Chow, coach, coach Ogeron. If you coach, coach, oh, uh, he was there. We had, I mean, we had incredible coaching staff and then he just started bringing in dudes, man. He bringing in dogs and just bodies. And, um, and we got really good, really fast. And by the end of my, my time, um, on the team as a senior, it was 2003, 2004, we won a national championship, which was, uh, an incredible experience. We could, you know, we could dive into that, but, um, yeah, that was that, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll tell a, a story. I've told this before, but it's always funny is, um, you know, one of the good and the bad things about going to a school like SC at that level is I was a safety and I show up and, you know, I, I think because I grew up in a family that had a very, very, very high level athletes, much better than myself. Um, you know, there's humility. You always know there's someone bigger, stronger, faster, and not everybody who goes to SC knows that until they get there. I kind of knew that going in. But, you know, I, I felt good about what I brought to the table. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I didn't feel confident. And I remember like one of our first practices, first padded practices, you know, I'm in, I'm in like a, a drill line and, um, I didn't even see the, the play. I just heard it. I heard like the thump, like, like, Phew. I'm like, what was that? So, you know, you see like a body flying and man, who was that? I'm like, yes, uh, that's Troy Polamalu. Oh yeah. And I go, Oh man, like you could just tell like I flashes, like he's good. Like what position does he play? Plays your position. <laughs> I was like, Oh <laughs> shit. All right. Like, and it was, I think it was like 72 hours into my career. I was like, man, and into my time at SC, I was like, I might need to find something else to do with my life, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, uh, I love football. I love the experience. I gave everything I had, um, when I was there, you know, showed up and did every workout, you know, and, and, uh, and went hard and, you know, eventually I'd like to think I delivered more hits than I took, but, um, but even very, very early on in my collegiate career, I was like, you know what? I probably am going to need to find a career. Like I'm the NFL. Yes. That was my dad's destiny, but that probably isn't mine and that's okay. I think growing up in that family, yeah, you, 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 you get to see and you get to experience a lot of the benefits. Okay. The fame, the, the, the ropes that get open, the doors that are open, but more than anything, you get the benefit of seeing the, the underbelly, the nasty parts of, of, of having a, you know, being in some way affiliated with a relatively famous father or whatever brother. And, um, you see the toll it takes on their bodies. Like, you know, you, and, and so I would it be like after games, I mean, he'd be, he'd be, he'd be hurt. He'd be, and my dad's a freak. Like he played 19 years, the most games ever in the history of the NFL at linebacker. I don't, I don't think that's been broken again. I'm not like 278 NFL games in addition to college, in addition to high school. So like, I, you know, count that up. And all he ever had was like a broken arm and a broken ankle. Like he, yeah, he's, he's, he's made of like a different steel, my old man, you know, and my uncle too, like he has the most games ever in the history of the NFL as an offensive lineman. God dang. So like, you know, they're just built differently, but I, you know, I just use there, it takes a toll physically, but how about this? How about mentally? How about, you know, my dad picking me up from soccer practice and like, there's no, so this is like the late eighties and early nineties, There's no social media, there's no satellite. So you turn on the radio and like you turn on sports talk radio and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm 12 years old and there's someone going off, just ripping your father on the, on the, on the radio. Like, oh, you know, Clay Matthews, he's old. They should cut his bum ass. Like, <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, or, you know, and this works both ways. It's 1993. I'm in, you know, whatever, sixth grade, fifth grade. No, this would have been 89. So maybe I'm in like second grade. And, um, 
you know, a couple of weeks before my, my dad made a mistake in a game and he was a very high level player, but he made a mistake. And like, I got kids at the school like, man, your dad, my dad said this about your dad. And you're like, all right, fine. And then three, three weeks later, they're in the divisional championship game against the bills. And it's, it's the last play of the game on the five yard line. Jim Kelly drops back, throws it Thurman Thomas, my dad picks it off to win the game and go to the AFC championship. And then it just flips and everybody's your buddy and everyone's like super fired up. And then, then you, then the, the radio is talking about what a hero and it, it kind of like, it, it not just numbs you to the, to, to what everyone outside of your like real family and close friends say. And, and it helps, I think in many ways running a company or, you know, achieving success in whatever you choose to do, but you kind of, it just, it teaches you a very valuable lesson is like, don't get too high, don't get too low yeah. and don't look for value and affirmation from the masses because you're never going to get it. And well, we were just talking about that. So everything you just said, you imagine 1993, you're on a radio show, seeing public opinion shift that quick. Yeah, it's brutal. And now the world has given us the opportunity to shift yeah. our opinion every two mm. seconds. Um, and you have kind of a strong opinion about that. Let's just just go down that just for a little bit, social media, how you think about the world today with that in the mix. You know, I, uh, I, <laughs> I've been wrong about social media, so I'm not probably the best person to, to comment on it. I remember I was in college, I was dating my now wife and she was like, yo, check out this website. And I was like, what is this? She's like, oh, it's this website. You could post photos of your life and like people can like them and connect all these people. I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> who, would want, who, who would want to do that? Like, that's so intrusive. She's like, no, it's, this is big. I was like, you are so wrong. Uh, What's the name of that website? Facebook. Like, yeah. Never hear that again. So like, I don't know if, I don't know if like there's really value to my opinion. I just think, um, uh, social media at a personal level is very dangerous, generally speaking, destructive. And, um, I think it, it, it's, um, if you use social media as like basically a living Christmas card, it works like, Oh, I want to keep people in touch with like how the kids are growing up and that's fine. Like, but nobody really has that discipline. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, I think from a personal level, it could be really, really tough on people and, uh, mentally and, and their, 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 their self-image, how they feel about how they're doing, whether it's like physically, um, uh, professionally, financially, uh, because even though you know it, you don't, you don't know, like you, you lose sight of the fact that you're looking at everyone's curated images of their life and, um, and it's not real. And you, you say that to yourself, but you don't actually, like, it doesn't, it doesn't show up. The, yep. the, you're just constantly like, man, like I suck. Right. Yep. And I need, I, I'm not, I'm not close enough deals. I'm not making enough money. Or how about this? Like, I, I'm not, I'm not skinny enough. I don't look good enough. And I just think that generally speaking, uh, people don't have social media are much happier. Yeah. And I, I, I don't, I don't know if, I, I don't know if like reports say that, but I'm, if I had to guess, that's a, that's a thing. So, um, real quick, I did want to finish the question about like, finish it. Uh, I'm at SC careers. Not, so I wanted to get into real estate. I always want to get my real estate. My dad owned one building, an apartment building. And, uh, he had bought it from my grandfather. So that's, that's how we got into real estate that, and I would, we would go to the building because <clears throat> I was the oldest son. So I got all the, the bad jobs, right? Say, like, Hey, we got to wake up early. We got to go to the building. We got to, you know, turn a unit. We got to, you know, we got to collect some rent. We got to get the laundry income. And I would go to this building, and, you know, and I, as I was coming of age, I was like, Hey, what is this? And he's like, oh, that's apartment building. And it's like, you know, it's 20 units in LA. I was like, man, so what does it do? He's like, well, people live here and they pay me rent. I was like, wait, so they live here and they just, they have to give you money every month. And he's like, yeah, I was like, man, that's so cool. <laughs> I was like, I want to do that. How do I do that? So, uh, coming out of college, I knew I wanted to get into real estate. I didn't have any money and I really didn't have any real estate skills. I wasn't a real estate finance major. Um, I, ha I didn't do internships in real estate in that sense. And so brokerage was my path and, and that's how I got into brokerage right out of college. And, um, you know, and, that's, uh, that's led to me being here today. All right. Well, we're going to unpack all that, but there's one thing you, you said in there that I've written down. You said Pete Carroll showed up and like the team turned around pretty quickly. And then we were, we've been talking and we're going to talk a lot about your transition from broker to leader, but what did you learn from Pete Carroll that he could come into a, call it an average football team and turn it around it's clearly a leadership skill yeah. that he brought. What did he bring that's kind of stuck with you? Yeah. Um, 
uh, just, uh, so many things, I mean, there's so many layers is uh, unbeknownst to me at the time I was getting a firsthand education, a firsthand view into how to build and run and ultimately sustain an incredibly high performance team or company. Again, you know, that yeah. version of team, uh, but have a great time doing it. Yeah. Um, I would say football at that time. And even today, like, uh, Nick Saban, you look at the sustained, sustained success at Alabama, but you know, Nick's intense. He was one of my dad's coach for the Browns D coordinator. So, and like, there are times I'm watching Alabama play and they win a lot of games, but I'm like, I don't know if they look like they're having a great time for whatever reason at SC, we were able to win just as many games, just as many championships, but like, we had such a good time and that was all due to Pete and how he approached it. So hit the foundation at SC was competition. Yeah. Iron sharpens iron. Right. Yeah. And so he would bring, he would say, he would, he would tell us, he would say, I'm going to go out and recruit the absolute best athletes around the country. And he was very good at that. So he was just a great salesperson. He was, he had a very clear vision. He communicated that vision to the, to the recruits and said, this is what we are doing. Here's the value to you. And here's how it's going to put you in a position to be successful. Ultimately likely get drafted and high to the NFL, which, which many, many, many of my teammates did. And, um, and you know what he did? I'm, dude, I'll never forget his first like recruiting class. He sat the whole existing team down because the recruits sign in the spring, but they don't really show up till the summer to start working out. So it was like start of spring ball. The recruiting season had just finished. We had just signed this, like the number one class. And it was the first time SC. And he sat the whole team down and he said, Hey guys, we had a great signing day. And I want you to see who's coming in to take your jobs. And we had to sit there and we had to watch these guys' highlights as a team. <laughs> there were some good players, man. And you're sitting there and you're like, damn. Dude. And like, it's fight or flight. And we had some we had some guys on the team who were like, he's recruiting my replacements. I'm out of here. And they transfer out and get in Pete's attitude was get them out. They're yep. soft. The marshmallows. Mentally weak human beings we do not want here. Yep. Get them out of here. They will break in the fourth quarter. They will forget their assignment. They'll, they'll, they'll fake it. They'll do something. They will expose us late in a, in a, in a big game. If, if just having someone come in at their position basically causes them to want to transfer out, get them the fuck out of here. Yeah. Right, can I say that? Yeah. You All can right, say so, whatever you want. So, um, <laughs> but like the actual, like we call full-time savages, they would sit there and be like, bring this punk ass in here. Like, let's go. Like, and, and you know what? And it drove it drove those that stayed to get better. And, and, and I'll speak for myself, whatever the best version of myself as a player, which wasn't enough to start there and that's okay. But I'm telling you, it drove me to be the absolute best version of myself. Like I trained as hard as I possibly could. I lifted as hard. I, I worked out as hard. I watched film again. God made me never to be as good at football as Troy Polamalu. <laughs> and, and as hard as that was for me to come to that, like, it was like, I'll find something else to do. And I, I think I was able to apply a lot of this mentality lessons into brokerage and that, that allowed me to get going. But, um, but so the, the first thing Pete did was he just, he brought that like competitive mindset. Like, not only are we going to do this, if you're the type of player we want, if you're the type of mentality we want, you're going to want this because you're going to want these guys to push, to push you. And what we found is as these guys were coming in, as these five stars, just absolute studs were coming in practice started getting like ones versus ones, twos versus twos. That was another thing. We did a lot of full pad practice. And then he would, a lot of times in college programs, either before or probably after they, they do like the starting offensive unit versus like scout team. Yeah. And then the starting defense versus the scout team offense at SC, he goes, no, we're going ones versus ones every day, full pads. And he's, it's competition. He would create scenarios, of the 10, the five and the two yard line. And then we would rank him and whichever, whichever unit won, the other unit had to like, we had to do up downs. We had to do barrel. Like it was, it was intense. And, and so the, the practices got so hardcore, like the, and you, the, as the talent elevated throughout my time there, you were going against guys in practice that by the time the game came on Saturday, it was easy. Like there's no way that guy across the line at, at UCLA is nearly as good as the left tackle and pass rushing again. So the receiver I'm covering or the running back, I'm trying to beat for a sack in practice. Like that punk ass player in that powder blue uniform, like that, that's not going like, to, the and that's why we smashed them every year, you know? Um, so, 
uh, you know, that's just, that's just how we got after it. And then, so the games almost became easier. And then we started smoking people. And so it created this like highly competitive environment. And a lot of times I think where the mistake is made in leadership that I got to see Pete do was they create this high pressure, high stress environment. And then there's never a release yeah. and you win a lot, but you don't either necessarily enjoy it. Or, and sometimes there's like an implosion. There's like this, it's just everyone mentally breaks. What Pete did was he had a very good, he understood human beings so well. And I, that's, a, that's, that's, that, I don't know if that's a skill you can learn. I think Pete just had it and he was born with it. And I don't know if, if anyone's ever met Pete Carroll and said, man, I don't like that guy. Like you don't like him because he beat your team, but I don't think if you actually met him, you'd like, he's such a likable guy. And so he knew exactly that moment up until the point where like, we were like, we were a little too stressed. Like it was right, you know, the week preparing for the, the national championship when everyone's stressed and it's the biggest game of your life and it's, it's and it, you know, the, the rings on the line and the, the trophy. And then all of a sudden, like Snoop Dogg would show up to practice <laughs> and he would like, you know, he'd play, he, he'd practice with his entire practice. Or like, I remember one time he like, he was like, yo guys, Hey, just don't, don't worry about it. Like, I know this sounds weird. We got a guy trying out. He's a punter. We're just looking for some help on the kicking team. And, you know, I've already, Mike, Mike, our punters, I already talked to Mike. He's cool with, he understands like this just, you know, we're just looking to always get better. He's like, so he's over there and we look and there's this guy and he's in, you know, a helmet, full pads. He has a visor on. So you're already like, wait, why is a punter wearing a visor? (laughs) And his body is just like, his body's like, I guess he's a punter, but God, he doesn't look like an athlete, like whatever. And we're, we're doing our drills, doing our drills. And then at the end of practice, like, all right, he, he's going to take some, he's going to do some punts. And like, and I'm on like punt pro team. I'm on like, I'm on punt, punt protection team. And I'm like blocking for this guy and his punts are horrible. He's like, Hey, we're going to try him out. And like, we're all sitting like, man, what is going on? Like, this is such a waste of time. This guy is not going to make the team. Like what, what's happening? <laughs> so then he's like, all right, but Hey, I want live drill. All right, we're going to punt. He's going to return it. I want you guys to go down and tackle him. And then I'm on, I'm on, it's a punt pro. And then you you release and you go and you run down field and you look to smash somebody. So they get the ball. This guy catches, he can't even catch it. He's running and I'm running down or running down like whack, you know, just like smashing this guy. And then he's like, all right, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And we're like, this guy sucks, man. <laughs> and we did three or four of them. And all of a sudden it's like, people as a whistle, like, all right, Hey, practice over. Come on up. I want to give you, he's like, Hey, you know, Will look, and, and this guy's sitting kind of on the outside. He's like, Hey man, loved having you out here, but Hey, I don't think it's going to work out. And he takes his helmet off. And it's Will Ferrell. <laughs> and, we, and he's like, you know what? F you, coach. I don't even want to be. And we just started like dying. And this is like, from what I can remember, this is like bowl practice week. This is the most stressful time of the year. Everything you've done for this for the entire season is leading up to this moment to win the Rose Bowl or win the Natty. And and this is how he Pete was so good at like just breaking that. We're like, we're dying laughing. And then it's like four days before the biggest game of our life. And so you asked the question, what was it about Pete that he did so well? And um, I want to make sure I answer that question. He did two things. He set the table and set the tone and the foundation of the entire program was, we are going to compete at all times. We will never stop getting better. If you can't handle the pressure, if you can't handle, if you want to go somewhere to, you know, to like, you know, kind of have a nice little career, I'll take it to brokerage. You want to go do a couple deals, go work at another company. Like, that's like, you come here to be the absolute best, whatever you can be, whatever we can get out of, whatever last drop of juice we can squeeze out of the orange. That is you physically, mentally, emotionally. Like that's why you come to SC at at that time. And hopefully now again with uh, Lincoln Riley, that's why you come to Matthews. I love it. And then you celebrate. And then you celebrate and you act like an absolute clown and you have a great time. You celebrate your success. You celebrate your teammates' success. That's a big thing. Um, I remember one time it was in a scrimmage real quick and then we move on. Um, I was close to making a big play, which, you know, <laughs> selfish, selfish say I want to make a play. And a teammate beat me to the, to the tackle for a loss. And I, I was happy for my teammates. One of my closest buddies, but I, something about my body language, it, it, um, it just like, I was frustrated. I didn't get there. And like the play, he get over it right now is, and he grabs my face mask and, and he's like, Hey, you need to be able to be happy for your teammates. And uh, he's like, you need to show enthusiasm. And I said, I know, no, no, I know I'm happy, but like, man, I wanted to get there. And I said, it's hard to be enthusiastic when I mo- don't make the play. And he goes, well, false enthusiasm is better than no enthusiasm. And I was like, like, and I just, 
Like he's right. Like even if there's a time where your teammate gets to the play before you or an agent at the same company gets a listing before you, even if you, even if you truly don't feel it, like just make them think you do. And you'll be shocked at how quickly you'll be like, you know what? Actually, like I am happy. I'm happy. Even though I want to be the number one agent, I'm happy that they are in that business. I call it sibling rivalry. I want all my siblings to, to be successful. I just want to be a little more successful. You know, I can relate to that so much. Talking about treating others and somebody once said to me, you know, why don't you compliment that person or whatever? And, and, in my, in my head, it was like, cause I don't really mean it. I would, that would be being fake. It was like a moral justification yeah. to me. And they go, well, how's that strategy working out for you? A hundred percent. And I was like, not very good. And they were like, why don't you just fake compliment that person and just see what happens? You compliment them, you see them light up, you see their energy, you and it actually about yourself. Correct. Yeah. You, and uh and then all of a sudden, you know, you track more flies with honey than shit, right? That's and so mm. my dad used to say that he my dad didn't ever curse something I gotta get better at. So um, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think he would say you track more flies with honey than you know, poop or whatever. But like it never left me. It's like, okay, I I, I talk a lot about like it's like Jordan, Michael Jordan, when he got in the league, he just want, you know, just go after Larry Bird and magic. He just want to beat him. And I think a lot of that is being young. Like I'm guessing it was when you were younger in your career, yeah. you, you hadn't yet achieved that the heights you had or, you know, um, and, and Jordan hadn't become the goat yet. But eventually what he found out is like, you can want to be better than someone. You could want to compete to beat their ass and to win championships, but that in no way should ever rob you or take away your ability to have massive appreciation for their skill. Yep as well as gratitude that they exist, it forces you to get better. So when I was a young agent, I'd look at agents that were more accomplished or more successful, like, you know, this guy, like, <laughs> but as I came up, I realized, first of all, they were very good for a reason. They were good. Like they, their skills, their, their communication, val communicating value of rep, their, their enthusiasm, their ability to overcome objections, like their commit to the grind. Like what I say, full-time savages, like they were full-time and first of all, I eventually was like, you know what? I just can't hate on this guy. Like, or gal is like, he's a stud, like credit to you. But then I realized that I needed those boogeymen. I needed them out there because if they weren't there, like what gets me up in the morning? Like not every day can I just rely on my natural, like I'm just fired up to be here. Like there are some days you need, you need that, um, what are they in the movie? The protagonist, uh, protagonist, like, um, you need someone to like say no, like that person's out there and and they're out there doing it. So you got to do it too. And eventually I, I had gratitude for those people being in my life as competitors because I knew that ultimately not only would I be a better version of myself, I would achieve more success and I would I would do better in my career because they existed. Yep. And then you end up wanting to be around those people and you develop actual close personal relationships and you get to know them. And more often than not, you actually realize they're successful, you're successful because from a personality and mindset, you have tremendous amounts in common and then you develop genuine friendships. So, um, yeah, you know, a hundred percent I'm on the same page with you on that one. You, you look at like Tiger Woods, like any PGA tour player would say him coming into the game elevated, elevated everybody, everybody to, to not even places like the next level to places they never even thought was possible. Um, and yeah, you see it with the greats. They, they bring everybody else around you and give you whatever a chip on your shoulder if you don't already have one. Yeah, we, we, we talk about that at Matthews all the time. The company is the Matthew, we, Matthews mentality. It's like that, I can't, I can't make you think that way about life. I can't make you see other people that way, um, whether it's competitors outside the company or even like, you know, your, your teammates within the company where yes, you want them to be successful, but you want to be the number one agent, but you need them a lot more than you think. And not to like, not for your own reinforcement of good, happy feelings and, and like to, you know, to give you a hug when you're down. No, you need them to push you. Yep. You need them to push you because the truth is somewhere deep down, there's always, you could always be doing more. And a lot of times you'll never know how much you got in, in you until someone forces it out of you. Yep. All right. So you get out of college. Um, the NFL wasn't going to be for you, but you were going to kind of create your own NFL or your own sport and you got into brokerage. Yeah. And now let's kind of just start going down the road of like you, you took to it quickly. You were hyper focused on it and you said, I'm going to be like the best there ever was. How did you become, how, how did, what, what makes a great broker? Like what started happening in those first years that gave you the confidence and started building your business? Well, I, I, you know, 
a little history lesson here. Uh, I think people make assumptions and I understand why as to where I'm at today, like, oh, it, you know, it just was a natural fit for you and you started off fast. No, I did not. <laughs> I was awful. I was terrible. I did not close a deal for 17 months. And what year did you enter the industry? 2004. Okay. So, 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 so hold on. Let, financial, let, yeah. Yeah. Let Let's me set, set the, the table. Stage. The greatest market ever. And I closed nothing. And to give you a sense of how bad I was. Now, <laughs> this is what makes me so effective as the CEO of a brokerage company is I say, if I could do it, you could do it. Cause there's no way you're worse than I was. But I, but the one thing I had that maybe not everyone have is I never, ever, ever was going to quit ever because you know what happens? You know what you are when you quit? A quitter. You're a fucking quitter. <laughs> and I am not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. Um, we're not allowed to quit my family. Uh, my dad told me a lot of things when I growing up, most of them I probably didn't listen to, but I remember that one. I, I knew that I was never allowed to quit a sport ever. Um, one of my kids is struggling with sport right now. He's like, dad, I don't want to play this. I said, yeah, sorry, dog. You can't quit when the season's over. You can choose not to play the sport again. Now you got to play another one. You always got to be active, but you will never quit. You're a Matthews and Matthews never quit. It's not that. allowed. And I just was, I was like, well, I guess I can't quit. And it just stuck with me. <laughs> it just stuck with me. So I was like, I never can quit. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get successful in this business. And then I'm going to quit because I, I hate brokerage. What was your first day like? You showed up, you probably had I, I, no, no, baggy no. khaki pants. Oh, no, the worst. Them. Dude, I had the, I had the Marcus and Milichab uniform. I probably had a black suit, black shirt, gold tie, brown pants. And, you know, I was balling on a budget, baby. Oh, yeah. Uh, the night before I- Living night, on a draw, baby. Yeah, no, I didn't have a draw. I, I had I had debt. Um, so, uh, listen, listen. I, um, the night before my first day at the office, I had to YouTube, thank God YouTube had just come out like nine months before I had to YouTube how to tie a tie. No one in my family ever had a job. Yeah. Oh, that's like, true. They all played football. Yeah. I don't, you know, and, uh, I, I showed up and so I didn't, you know, I probably wasn't listening, but I didn't know what time to show up. So I showed up at 5:45 because in the morning, my work was so, so let me tell you. I showed up my first day at 5.45 in the morning and I showed up at 5.45 every day for the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah. Until COVID. Until COVID. Yeah. So every day for my entire career, I get in the office at 5.45. So what time do you wake up? I wake up at 4.45. What? I hate it. I'm not a morning person. I hate waking up. My bed is so comfortable. But All I right. do it. I do it because someone else is out there and they're doing it too. Yeah. You know, so I said, you got to have a boogeyman. And so... um, <laughs> So anyway, listen, I get there the first day at 5.45. You know what time the first agent showed up? 7.30. I sat outside for an hour and 45 minutes. And, um, and that was that. And uh, I showed up the first day. I didn't know what a cap rate was. I didn't know what IRR was. Um, I showed up like, I got so much love for Marcus. They hired me, they gave me a shot, but like, I, they, didn't, yeah, I, they didn't have computers for you. So I showed up and they were like, where's your computer? I was like, do I not have a computer? He's like, no, you got to buy one. So I, was, I had to buy a computer. And, um, and so I will say, um, just getting kind of into the question of brokerage, I, um, I knew I didn't know anything about real estate. I really didn't. I knew I didn't know anything about sales. I was a very, I am a naturally very introverted, shy person. I'm pretty confident I have the world's worst case, undiagnosed case of social anxiety disorder. Like I really, really am shy and I don't like talking to people which is hilarious that I went into brokerage because I didn't know what brokerage was. You know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, this is a true story. I, my dad and I are very close, so I could I could tell I could share these stories in public forum. Um, you know, I was interviewing for a job, and it was like the first interview I went on. And you know, my dad calls me. I was like, "Hey, how'd it go?" I was like, "Oh, it's good." And like I felt like really good. I feel like they may offer me a job. It's cool. Like you're gonna t you know, take it. I was like, "Well, I don't know. I got some other interviews, and you know, I'm not sure this is what I want to do." And he goes excuse me, who do you think you are? You get the luxury of choosing. You take the first job that's offered to you. <laughs> Marcus and Milich Avancino, first job offered. I said, I'm in. Boom. My, my old man told me so. Boom. And um, Bring your own computer. I, no I didn't know. Pay. I didn't know that. I, didn't, I don't even know if I knew I didn't get paid. I was like, <laughs> showed up for a second. Like, How much did I get paid, dog? Like nothing. All right, fine. Perfect. So anyway, 
Um, I will say that I, I knew I didn't know real estate. I didn't have skills, but I knew I had one thing. It was an indomitable will to outwork anyone and everyone. I would sacrifice more than anyone else. And one of the best things about coming out of that, that again, it's not the military. It's not that serious, but it's a military lifestyle in college football. Like every morning I'm waking up at 5.30, workout six to eight, school eight to 12, lunch, um, uh, training table one to one to two thirty, film two thirty four thirty, practice four thirty to seven thirty, then training table again, then film, then bed, boom, night after night after night from eighteen to twenty two years old, like that was my life. Yeah, right? and so, and looking back, like I don't think that was most people's college life. Mm-hmm. And so, man, I feel like I missed out, like you know. And uh, but I I got into brokerage, so I was like, all right, well, I wake up early, I can stay, I can work. And um, I went to my manager at the time, Jonathan Weiss, who's a very special person to me. He he hired me, he he tra- he coached me, like, and I said, you know, I said, hey, who's the who's the who's the person who gets in the earliest? And he's like, oh, that guy, he's you know, six thirty. Okay, who who stays late? He's like, oh, it's that that person over there. He's like, stays till eight thirty. I was like, all right, I'm again in thirty minutes early. I'm gonna stay thirty minutes later. So I worked six to eight thirty, six to nine more or less every day in my life from the 22 to 35. And that includes getting married, having kids. Like that was just where I was mentally. Cause I, I said, I have to make this work and I know nothing. And because I know nothing and I worked those hours and I was making more cold calls than ever. Like, you know, we have with standards at Matthews, you start to make 500 cold calls a week. Like I was ripping 550, 650 a week because my ratios were so bad. I go on a meeting. I couldn't convert it to a BOV. I'd present BOVs. I couldn't earn listings. Like because I was so uneducated. And at the time, this isn't just unique to the company I was at. I think at the time, the the business generally was understood. Like there wasn't like formal structured mentorship programs. It was like, here's a phone. Let me know when you need me. Don't bug me until you have a hot lead. I was like, I don't know what a hot lead is. Like, what, what does that mean? Like they said they want to buy value add multifamily in Beverly Hills and ACAP. That's a hot lead, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's not. But, um, but I just was never going to quit and I just kept getting better. And finally my first three listings expired because the only listings I could get were overpriced ones. So they're like, oh, this idiot will take this deal at this price. And if it doesn't sell, it doesn't bother me. Um, but finally about 17 months in, I closed a deal and then six months later, I closed another, then three months later, I closed another. And then I started rolling and I got better, but I would say, I just, I always want to, I always want to correct the record is a lot of people. And I understand why I assume like, oh, like brokers, he was just, dude was born for it. No, I, I, I couldn't have been not more born for this profession than any person ever, which allows me to look a, another person in the eyes, many of them young coming out of college, guy or gal whether they have the best personality or the worst, whether they know a ton of real estate or not. And I look in the eye and I said, you could be the greatest of all time, but you just can never quit. You have to keep going. Most don't. Yeah. Okay. But it gives me tremendous conviction when I'm, when I'm coaching these young men and women up in the business because I did it and I didn't have any real estate skill sets. I didn't know anything about sales. My personality is not and I'm cool right now because like, you know, it's four of us in a room and, and I could get rolling. But if you ever see me at a conference, like I am back against the wall, frozen, just like, I don't want to be here. 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 Like, get me out of here as quickly as possible. And so, and and my entire family is like that, like period. And so um, when we're at the next conference together, I'm going to go around no, the room no, and no. tell everybody, hey, go talk. Yeah. To and, you, and you know what? Then get ready to scrap. Bro. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, you know, cause yeah. And I, you know, I'll just dip. I'll just dip. I'm like, I'm out. And they're like, but those are all real estate. I, was like, I get that. I'm out. Like life's, life's too short. I'm dealing with this. All right. So you're there. You have your baggy pleated uh, khaki pants yep. and oversized coat. Yep. And you got, you did, took you 17 months. Yeah. I, looking like an Uber driver. Looking yeah. like an Uber yeah, driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're getting paid like one, two at the time. No, 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 no. Uber drivers are way better paid. Though. Okay. So we're not even there. Yeah. What? In California, Uber drivers get like benefits. What no. is it, UA, UAB5 or whatever that <laughs> proposal or the, the proposition was? <laughs> Yeah. What was the tipping point? Was was it somebody? Was there like when did you start to get it? Great financial crisis. Okay. TFC. Best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, Why? I, because I was the only one dumb enough to keep working and not give up. Yeah. And everyone else who was smarter than me, more educated, they're like, dude, brokerage is a horrible industry. You got to get out. Real estate is literally the epicenter of the the metaphorical bomb that went off in our economy. 
get out of real estate, like get whatever job you can and brokerage. There are no transactions. Like you, my friend, are an idiot. And at this point, you'd been in for four years. Four years. So you were kind of starting starting to make hay. I'll just look. I my first year I made no money. My second year I made like a hundred grand. Third year is like three hundred. So you're like, yeah, dude. I'm all right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, (laughs) baby. You know, like I'm about to be paid. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> it went back down. Um, it went back down big time. And um, year five, like year four, it went down to two fifty. Year, year five was like, dude, it was like one hundred and ten grand. Now I was like, I'm, I had closed like three or four deals in the worst two thousand nine. But I was like, you know, I got a job. Like I'm paying my bills. I think I was married at the time. My wife had like a job, and I was like, yeah, I was the richest man in Babylon. Like I was like, this is I'm living the the high life. Like no way am I giving up this gig. <laughs> Well, I was at an office that had like 80 desks, you know, and it was like they had 80 desks and there were 81 people at all times pre GFC. Well, by 2009 and 10, there were like 20 dudes. It was just, it was a wasteland. It was me in one cube and I did retail. So shopping centers and a little net lease. And the guy who sat across from me, Dave Harrington, did multifamily in LA. And, and, um, Dave's now president of our company and we just, we just every day pushed each other. We just, every day just looked each other in the eye and just basically like talk shit to each other. Like you're a little bitch. Like I'm like, make more calls than you. And like, we just, we just pushed each other. We just pushed each other. And, um, and we were, like I said, the only guys dumb enough not to quit, dumb enough to keep making calls, dumb enough to think that any call or any meeting or any BOV would ever even lead to a deal that would sell because almost none of them did. But what happened was in 2011, started getting a little better, still sucked. But like you look at year over year transaction volume started going up and then it was still like, you know, 20% of like, you know, the pre GFC peak 2006 and then 2012 and it got a lot better. And then 2013, the deals came back. But the thing about brokerage, and this is true about your business and the principle, the deals come back, but the brokers don't come back as fast. Right. So the deal volume comes back, but the broker's it takes a while for the, the ranks of brokerage to fill up. And the ones that do, they're new. And you're four, five, six, seven years in the business. You have more experience. But more importantly, you went through a massive crisis and your skill sets are on point now. Now you're like, I know how to manage pricing expectations. I know how to, how to um, overcome objections. I know how to just look emotionally and mentally. I know how not to get too excited about a deal because I just went through a period where nothing was selling. And I, I can't count that money before it closes because I'm it's probably never going to see it. And so I'm just mentally better suited for this for this business. And 2012, 13, 14, like, man, it like I got shot out of a cannon. Like it just went, you know. Um, yep. And, you know, I let's just say I hit heights that I had never in my wildest dreams thought were imaginable, created generational wealth to where just in a pure financial terms, never would ever, ever have to work again. Um, and, um, and it was all because of two things. I was never going to quit. And there was a massive dislocation in the market, not as bad as what we're seeing today, but today is a perfect, perfect, perfect example of that opportunity for so many young agents at Matthews, just in the business. It's a, it's a perfect opportunity for young principals. Yep. Um, because when the GFC hit the older guys, 50, 60, they had made so much money. They owned buildings. They had wealth and they had distractions. They had kids. They're like, I'm done. Yeah. I saw a lot of successful agents doing millions and millions a year before GFC say, okay, this is kind of like, this is it. It's like, it's time. Yeah. And then I saw insane amounts of 22 to 32 year old agents who had just either just quit because they weren't making money or they had made some money and they spent it all doing stupid things. Like, and I'm not just talking like popping bottles and buying boats. I'm talking like they had bought real estate, highly levered, then they lost it all. And that was a distraction. But then also again, brokerage was like not a career you wanted to be in at the time. So there's this giant chunk of your peer competition that's gone. And uh, one day you wake up and the bomb stops falling. You kind of look at yourself. You're like, dude, I'm like alive. Like, and you look around and everyone else is gone. And you're like, and all this is for me now. Yeah. And that is what's happening today. And that's the message I say, like, you know, you're seeing velocity declines of 55, 65, 75%. And everyone's like, this is so bad. I was like, well, first of all, this is how you and I get old. Like, it's like, oh, it ain't a great financial crisis, right? Because it isn't, <laughs> but it's, it's a real deal. Yeah, not yet. I don't think it'll be that bad. I don't even it, It's a real deal, but this is in a weird 
twisted sixth sense. This is what you want. You don't want anyone to suffer. You don't want anyone to feel financial pain, but you recognize like in really easy markets, any broker can, can make money. It teaches bad habits. Bad habits. In any good market where value, dude, industrial, like value is going up. Yeah. Bad operators, bad developers, bad principals, bad fundraisers. Like they, they can do, good ones do better always, but it's the tough markets. It's not that really good owners, really good agents make le- don't like make less money. We all make less money, but it gives you, it's, I call it the gold rush, man. The yep. gold rush for those two or three years coming out of a tough time, you just don't quit and just, just keep chopping wood, keep swinging the ax. Eventually the tree falls. And we did the, we, Zach, we did something the other day, like to the victor go the spoils, like the spoils of battling through this market or battling through the GFC, the spoils were significant on the other side. Well, it's like what you said with the football game. This is like where you're practicing your ass off because when the game starts again, yeah. it's just going to be easy. Yeah, yeah it, uh, you know, sh- some of those games were easy for us. Again, not for me. I'm, they, they're like, yo, Kyle, we need you to run down full speed and put your head into the wedge. I was like, I got that. Like, I can do that. And I was like, yo, can I get out there and like drop a little cover too? It's like, no way. Get you know. Just paint this one picture and you can paint it in 30 seconds, a minute. I don't care. But... For anybody going, man, things are really tough right now. You kind of talked about 09, 10, but paint a picture. What was 09 and 10 like as a broker? Because it was, it was dark. It was dark. Uh, it was empty. What was your pitch? What did you tell people in 09? Man. Hey, sorry you bought that building for 10 million, but I'll sell it for two no, right now. You know, yeah. You know, by then <laughs> I had started to get better and I realized... <laughs> I realized while I had to have an interest generator on the call, I had to have a purpose for the call. Really the, the best way in sales to get something going is, well, keep them from hanging up. And that's the interest generator, something of value. Like, hey, a deal just traded down the street. Hey, I just saw this, this lease get executed. And here are the updated market rents. And at that time they were falling and just said, look, I'm here to provide this information. And Ideally, you know how it's valuable to you. I, ideally, you know how it applies it. If not, I, I can provide that to you. Let's grab, let's grab coffee. Let's grab lunch. You got to eat. You might as well let me pay for it. Like was I always said, like, um, <laughs> it was pretty effective. Like, yeah, I guess so. Um, I only did, I really only did breakfast meetings because it was the cheapest meal. <laughs> There's an intimacy about breaking bread with people. Yeah. It's the cheapest meal and it had the lowest opportunity cost of my time. Yeah. I'd, I'd say, hey, we breakfast at 6.30. Like 6.30, I was like, yep, 6.30. <laughs> so 6.30 to like 7.45, I do breakfast. I get out of there for like 25 bucks and I'd, I'd have that meeting and I'll talk about what we were talking about in a second. And then I get to the office by 8.30 and nine o'clock call time. And then I still was ripping my coldies. You know, it was like, I was, oh my gosh. I was, I was hitting it. So, <laughs> um, so the answer to your question, I would just, do my best to keep the owners in touch with what was going on in the market from updated sales, updating rent, updating rents. That was really the driver. And then just getting them to engage in a conversation is like, look, what is happening at your building? What concerns do you have? I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not cold calling you saying I have the answers, but I certainly can work hard to achieve some sort of information, some provide some sort of service that I'm not saying you're not going to lose money. But there are there is one hundred percent ways to mitigate, mitigate mitigate those losses, and through me and the services and the information I have at my disposal and my effort, my energy and what I bring to the table, I could put you in a position. I'm not here to say I'm going to make you money, but I might be able to help you. I might be able to help to keep you from losing more. Yeah. And I don't. I most of the time on the call, you don't know how or why, but you, you know there is a way. You yeah. just you just need them to engage in a conversation. Then I get to that breakfast meeting and say, look. And I was retail. He's like, I got this strip center. Um, there's 10 units. I've already lost three tenants. My other seven, um, all of their rents are above market because this was like GFC. And like, okay, where are market rents? Like, okay, are there ways? Like, have you div- have you dove into your tenant's credit worthiness? Do you understand where market rents are? Um, what if we could kind of cut the line and say, all right, like they're paying 36 bucks a square foot and market's 28. What if we went proactively and said, hey, we'll give you 32, but we need you to extend the lease. And then, okay, extension, like we'll proactively reduce your rent, but we're just looking for a commitment here. We're looking to get the weighted average lease term of the, of the asset up um, to kind of, if nothing else, put your anxiety to bed 
And uh, ideally, maybe there's a there's a refinance on the table, but again, there weren't there were there was not a lot of lending going on. Just something, and maybe it's like, how about this? It's like kind of the greater full theory. It's like, hey, you have a you have an asset, and your rents are grossly inflated, um, and the weighted average lease term is four years. So in four years, most of those leases will come due, and there will be a mark to market. Like your rents are going to come down. Are you aware of this? No, I wasn't. Okay, this is this is a bomb, and there's a clock, and there's four years left on it. You do not want to hold this asset when when it does. So even if we have to sell it for less than what it's worth today in the GFC, which is less than what it was worth two years ago by far, that's still the right move and will get you into an asset. Even at the same yield, there's there's some closing costs. So your net effective yield will be lower than what you're getting. But if let's look at your wealth and what happens over five years by doing that trade versus staying in this, the net net is significantly better by executing this trade, even in a bad market. Because if you're doing a 1031, you're swimming in the same market. You sell low, you buy low. Yeah. You sell high, you buy high. I I always remind owners that. Like yeah. you don't get all the upside and then the downside. Right. So I would I would have that conversation. <laughs> I said, I understand the value of your assets gone down, but right now, and I'm I, I'd always say, I recognize and I empathize with, with you hearing that your value, the value of the assets less. I feel that. I know and I, like let me let me tell you, it's not about me, but this is the worst part of my job is coming and sitting down with an owner and saying the value of your asset, your holdings has gone down. But that doesn't change the fact that it has. And so now we need to talk about moving forward. What's the best path moving forward? But right now, there's another broker having another conversation with the owner of the asset you're going to buy who's saying the same thing. So your assets come down, their assets come down. But if we 1031, we'll get you into an asset, even if the yield's slightly less, but all of their rents are replaceable. Their price per pound is cheaper, therefore. The corner's a little better security wise, safety wise, even in one of the worst markets ever, ever, maybe this is a better asset than that. This is going to not be good. Let someone else take that risk. Let someone else, whether they're a fool and they just don't know, or they actually have a special relationship with certain tenants that they can get them to sign. Like that's fine. God bless. I, I always tell owners, we want them to do well in the asset, but that doesn't mean it's the right property for you. And then I got better and I was communicating it. So what what it was like? Let me let me. Um, so myself and Dave, we would carpool to save money for gas, right? Like we would bring lunches in. Like I was I, it, like it's cliche. We'd be making lunches, making little sandwiches. PBJ, PBJ. Yeah, I was more of like a turkey club guy. But, okay, you know, three pieces of bread or two, two. All right, yeah. You got to save on that I, money. I, you know, I was, I, dude. I wasn't working out. I had no time to work out, so I had to like, you know, <laughs> I had to keep the, my figure. And uh, I could, you know, I didn't have that luxury. <laughs> Um, and so we would rip like, you know, it's like your first couple of years in brokerage, you kind of know you're signing up for a lot of cold calls. Like most people, they'd say, let's 250, 300 for me, it was 500 cold calls, right? 500, 500 a week. And so for the first year, two, even three years. And then when like the 2007, I started making a little money, you start seeing that slip. Now, some of that is because, you know, I have six listings and I have four escrows and, and like, so there's only so much time in the day, but candidly, that's what the weekend's for. I could always get that time back. So it was probably because I felt like I was on the path. Years five, six, and seven, I got back to that darkness of like 500 cold calls, no deals. But again, I wasn't going to quit. So um, we were ripping 500 calls. Did you enjoy it? At that point in my life, no, 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 no. Cold calls, you know, I wasn't, I didn't dread them the way you you do early on because like you had been hung up on so many times, like, and you realize nothing bad happens. Yeah. Like I'd been called the worst things on the planet. And then I realized like, <laughs> n- like, it's not like they go on social media and post to like a hundred thousand people. Like, yo, this guy, Kyle Matthews just called me. He's an idiot. Like, yeah. you know, maybe they do that now. That sucks if they do. But, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I saw it like Twitter. Sometimes there's like owners like, yo, I just got this call from this broker and this is what he said. And he's so stupid. Look at this deal. It's such a bad deal. And I was like, dude, man, you're a fucking hater, bro. Like, <laughs> like come on. Like that, that's a human being on the other line. That's a broker trying to make it. And I understand he might've had a terrible interest generator. And I understand he might've even been a little rude. Like show that guy a little grace. Yep. Like, come on, like how bad is your life? You got to take time out of your day. How successful could you be if you're going on Twitter or something and posting about some call or some deal, a broker post and you're hating on it, like get a life. Yep. I, anyway, the, so cold that, calling has been the key to my early six. I would cold call and the, we're in 2023 and it's still the best way to generate business. It is great. Uh, there's no but to that. I would just say, how about this? Let me, let me, let me change the mentality for all the owners listening. <laughs> You don't want a cold call from the guy three times a day or whatever it is like, but you want him to call you when he's got that hot lead. How does that work? Yeah. Let me tell you how that works out for you. It doesn't. 
You know who that broker is going to call when he finally digs up that good? He's going to call the owner who was nice to him. He's going to call the owner who allowed him to, to the broker to take him to breakfast. He's going to call the owner who's like, hey, listen, I don't have anything. I know you call me a lot. Keep doing it. Because the owner is smart enough to realize, hey, this guy calls me once a month. Maybe he has the same crappy interest generator. Like, what are your plans, right? That's bad interest generator, <laughs> you know. But, but I know that that's going to take five minutes, 12 times a year, 16 minutes. That's one hour of my life. 10 years in a row, that's 10 hours of my life. But over the next 10, 10, 10 years, if this guy stays in the business and he sells me one deal, I'm going to make millions on it. And let me tell you, 10 hours to make a million dollars, that's $100,000 an hour. Is that a good return on your time? That's Fuck pretty yeah, good. That's, that's good pretty good. Time. I would take Don't that. Don't ever, ever, ever hang up on a cold caller broker. Yeah. Because you never know who's going to be the great ones. They all have the ability to be great. And you want them to send you your best, their best deal, the deal that you're going to make millions on, the deal that's going to change your life, but you don't want to take their five minute crappy cold call. Like that's not how it works, bro. That is not how it works. That is a great way to frame it. Well, I've had a lot of practice, you know, you have had a lot of practice. <laughs> like I, so I started doing this like, Hey, I don't want, you know, to only call me if you have a deal. And then as I got older, I got a little, you know, first of all, you have a little money. You're like, well, all right. like Okay. <laughs> but then I was, I, I was like, wait a minute, hold on time out. You want me to only call. And then I started battling these guys on the phone and most owners were like, all right. Like I like this. I like, and, and a lot of people responded positively to like, no, 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 no. I said, there's a, how many buyers of real estate, value add real estate are in this sub market? There's 50 buyers. There's a hundred, buyers. there's a hundred of you. There's only one of me who's made, ripping 500 cold calls to private clients, digging, d- dredging the swamps and beating the bushes. There's only one of me. So let's reset the table here. Like, I'm not going to say I'm more valuable, but we're on par. So let's, let's like, I, like I, I wanted the owners to know, like I was coming at it, like, hold on, I bring as much to you as you bring to me. This is a mutually beneficial relationship. You are not doing me favors right now. Yep. Okay. But I'm also not doing you favors. Like we can put each other in a position to be more successful but you got to take my cold call. You got to take the cold. You got to take the coldie. I used to tell people when I'd cold call them to buy their buildings, I'm literally trying to give you money. I am calling with a briefcase of money that I want to give to you in exchange for your property. That is, I'm not selling you life insurance. I'm not selling you some, you know. I'm not some asshole broker calling to get a listing. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I know. I'm. I could. It could be worse, man. I could be a broker calling. No, All is fair in love and war. <laughs> All right. Um. So, you uh, you never give up. You make it through the heat of twenty uh two thousand nine great financial crisis. By twenty fourteen, you're flying through the sky, and um, at some point, you decided maybe I'm going to go start my own deal. Mm-hmm. How did that transition happen? So I was at the first company I started at, I, I, my business has taken off. It's 2011, 12. Like I, I was doing really well. And, um, most of my, I was shopping centers, right. And, and retail and most of my business, um, it's a longer story and it's, it's, it's not as relevant to this conversation had gravitated to account-based, um, institutional business. And I was like a non-core and so retail had gotten hammered in the GFC more than like, you know, not more than anything, but it was, it was bad. And these uh, publicly traded companies had been punished for their BNC non-core assets. Like it, it just crushed their portfolios because that's where they, it, they had experienced a lot of pain, okay. but they had recognized their core top 15 MSA, you know, best, best, best assets actually did better. And so the street, you know, based on how their shares are, you know, they go up and go down, which drives a lot of the C-suites decision-making, as you know. Um, they said, Hey, we want to get rid of all our non-core assets. And so, you know, Kimco at the time had, and don't forgive me, I might be off by, but they had 800 centers and they, wow. they came out on a public, public call and said, Hey, we want to get down to 300 of like the best. And so I was like, well, they're going to sell 500 centers. And then like Preet said that and Weingarten and Regency and Bricksmore, which was central watt to Bricksmore and RPAI and Invent, Invent Trust. And I had just kind of like gotten in with a couple of them. Like, I'll tell you, you know, I have so much love and respect and so much gratitude. This guy, Dan Horowitz, he was the CEO of DDR, which is now Site Centers. Um, I'm actually gonna have Dan on the podcast in a couple weeks. See, this okay. is like, he, he's doing me fast. I was like, yo, Dan, you, like <laughs> fly out to Nashville, inconvenience yourself. So Dan, I appreciate you, man. I always got a nice <laughs> bottle of wine for him. So, um, so anyway, um, he just, 
I think he was, like, he played football at Colgate, I was football. And like, I don't, I couldn't even tell you how we, you know, connected. And he, they gave me a shot on like a crappy $3 million center um, in some nowheresville. And I worked my ass. And I actually, and I found a buyer. It was a tough, set. okay, fine. Then like Kimco, uh, Matt Golden, who's one of my closest buddies now in the business. Like he was, he was, he kind of handled the West. And like, I got to know Matt and he gave me a shot on like a really bad deal, a really tough deal in like Sacramento. And I got it done. And then I just called every other. I was like, hey, you know, I'm doing deals for DDR and Kimco. I think it's a good time we'd sit down and talk. I'm the, I'm the non-core specialist. Cause like at the time, all the brokers were like, yo, give me those big centers. And I was like, they're, they're going after a $70 million center. And my, my attitude was like, give me 10 sevens. Yeah. Right. Give, give me your worst. Give me your, give me your tired, you're hungry, you're poor. Like I'm the trash man. I'll take it out. There's a lot of money in trash as the, as the mafia figured out. Yeah. And, um, and so <laughs> I, I started getting in front of these decision makers and these owners, whether it's CIO, CEO, like EVP of transactions and saying like, Hey, I'm here to talk about these really tough assets. And they're like, man, nobody else wants to touch these things. Like brokers were still, they didn't want to get their, their fingers dirty. And I lived in the dirt and I was like, let's go. And I started selling them. And so I started doing all this institutional business with the largest operating REITs and then all, their private equity partners, like a Blackstone or Angelo Gordon, like, and the feedback, what that I started receiving at the time was like, Hey, we love working with you, but in committee, it's harder to get you approved from a sale because of, you know, whatever the flag you're, you're rocking. And, and so it was, that was like, you know, kind of just like, huh, okay. And then, cause my business was growing so much, I needed more support. And this is a big thing about Matthew. We'll, we'll dive into later. And the company I was at, it was like, Hey, I have, I now have 20 listings, 12 escrows. Like I still need to generate more business, a client interfacing, negotiating. Like it's, I, I call the sausage making, right? It's the production of BOVs and OMs, coordinating digital and ground photography, uh, drafting email blasts and negotiating at the time with like MailChimp or Constant Contact and how many, and of the postcard company. And like, I was doing, it's a do-it-yourself company. Like you are your own entire company basically. And, and at the time, and I don't know if it's changed, because it's been a while is it was like, Oh, you need to, you need help. Go hire it, go pay for it. So and I'm just, you know, I'm a simple minded guy. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I like to think I'm a good team and I'm like, okay, fine. Like, so then I hired an assistant and then it's like, I, I was doing more complicated deals. I, every deal I had to have a 10, 10 year cash flow model, lever and lever at IRRs. And then I had to hire an analyst. Then I had to hire like a graphics person, then a transaction manager. And then I'm, you know, I'm basically like this company. I, I have payroll, I have insurance. Like I, the worst part was I'm managing human beings, which is fine if that's what you sign up, but but I need to do RPAs, revenue producing activities is what we call them at Matthews. RPAs and brokerage. So, you know, cold call, meeting, pitch, negotiate. If you're not doing one of those four things at any given time, it's not a high value activity. It's not an RPA and it's probably inefficient. Okay. So at, when, at the company I was at, I got to a point where it was like 50, 50, 50% of my time. I was, I was making calls. I was meeting owners, traveling around the country, pitching deals, negotiating deals. But 50% of my time, I'm sitting there in like in design, Photoshopping a photo, you know, wondering like, you know, is there a better way to get more cars in this parking lot? Like, you know, the ground aerial photography back then they sent helicopters up. They didn't have drones. Like this is how old school <laughs> and it was very expensive, but like, it's like, yo, the helicopter went up on the wrong day. They went up on Thursday. They're supposed to go up on Saturday, Saturday. There were more cars in the parking lot. Now you got to get back up, but they don't want to. And it was just like, I'm like, this can't be good. And so it was kind of just a combination of things. I remember the big one was, um, I had a brother, I have a brother, uh, Clay drafted to the Packers and, um, and I had some clients call some owners say, Hey man, like we've always want to go to Lambeau field and we love, like, are you going? I was like, yeah, I'm going this fall. And like, yeah, we'd love to go. And I was like, Oh, you know, maybe I'll just put a crew together. I'll do a, like a client event. And, and so I got, I got like 12 big clients and none of them I had done business with. Like I had, I had conversational relationships. So it wasn't like I had never talked to them, but I hadn't done business with them. So I went to my manager. I was like, yo, I want to do this trip. And it's going to cost about 20, 20 stacks, you know, it's uh, it's going to be, it's, it's a big <laughs> one, which is like, you know, 40,000 today's, but, um, let's go. I was on a 60, 40 split. Like, Hey, I'll put in 12, you put in eight. We were talking about this earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, nah, we don't do that. I was like, eh, no, I understand. Like we had to do it for you. I do it for everyone. I was like, okay, fine. But like, not everybody's asking for it. It's fine. 
all right, how about this? I'll put up 20. And then like first deal that closes, just reimburse my aid. Like, no, we're not going to do that either. I was like, this is a good, he's, he's like, no, I don't disagree that this is a good strategy, but we just don't, this is not a business strategy. We don't. So I did it. I just put spent the 20 grand and this is like 2011, 12. Like, you know, it's, I, I still like, you know, I'm licking wounds from the GFC. I wasn't rolling like, you know, and um, $20,000 is a lot of money. We're still eating club sandwiches with two pieces of yeah, bread. Yeah, no, maybe, maybe, you know, I'm, maybe yeah. you got the third maybe piece of bread. Maybe I got some mayonnaise on it now. Oh, okay. Like I may even drop a tomato <laughs> at that point. Like, you know, I was starting to feel a little confident, you know, starting to get a little, a little you know, starting to blow up BM, BMF. <laughs> but uh, no, um, I, uh, so I did it and, you know, went on the trip. They had a great time, but it really was like, it was amazing because I got to know them on a personal level. They got to know me. I think they kind of felt like that energy I brought and, they're like, yeah, oh, we'll give this guy a shot. And like, you know, 12, I got over the next 12 months, I, I I was awarded two or three deals. Like, you know, and that brought in three, 400 grand, you know, who took their 40%, the company. And that's why I was like, man, this isn't a partnership like this. And, uh, and I just, that was what just kind of, I think that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It just, it was time. Yeah. And I'd been there for almost a decade and it had been a great run. And to this day, I had tremendous gratitude for the opportunity. And I'm very, very, very close with a lot of people there. So um, it just was time. Like I wanted to be at one company forever. It just, my, what I tell brokers all the time, if you are a fast growth broker, you got to be at a fast growth brokerage company. If you're a slow growth broker, you actually don't want to be at a fast growth. You want to be a slow growth. Like you kind of want to align yourself with the ethos and the energy and, and the capital investment and like the mentality of the leaders of the company you're at. So if you're an absolute dog and you're like, I'm growing, 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 let's go, go reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. And you're at a company that's generally kind of like stable, like, Hey, no, we're good. Like, no, we, we have our deployment, like everything fits p perfectly. It's going to create a lot of rub, a lot of friction. Yep. And you just don't want that type of aggravation or resentment in your life. Like yep. life's hard enough, let alone, you know, brokerage and without even getting into all the other things. And, um, and so I'm answering your question. Um, I ended up, uh, going over to a company Collier's, Collier's International. Okay. And, um, it was kind of like, it, <laughs> it was, uh, it was the same thing where it was like, it, it was, it was a do it yourself company. And again, I don't know if it's changed, but like, it was like, but the difference was they're like, Hey, we don't really do any retail. We love having you do whatever you want. So at that point it was like, I was effectively, they put me in this like office and once a month, my manager come by, you need anything? I'm like, nah, I'm good. And he's like, all right, cool. Like, <laughs> and, and I, I, I went there in January, 2013 and in 2013, um, you know, was their top guy in the West or whatever. And in 2014, I was a top guy globally out of, you know, however many, Damn. Thousand, yeah, out of however, however many thousand agents. And, um, I did not want to start my own company. Really? Yeah. So I'll tell you the story. I, 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 if, uh, I think people are shocked. Like it was, it was February, 2015. I'll try and condense this February, 2015. And my manager's like, Hey Kyle, we, we have this awards thing in Denver. It's like the Everest awards and you're the top producer. We want to give you an award. I was like, nah, man, you don't just, what is it like a trophy? Just send it to me. I, 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 I <laughs> again, I'm not shy. I do not want this, uh, love awards. Like not much, like go, but just put it over there. I, and it, it's not important to me, right? You giving me a higher split. Yeah. I'll fly out to Denver. Like you give me a support, let's go. But like award, like, no, it's all good, man. Honestly, you don't you know. He's like, no, 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 no. Like the, the president of America is going to be there and the CEO and there's like a thousand people. I was like, well, definitely not going. He's like, look, it would be a bad reflection on me if you didn't go. And I, one thing I'm always going to be, is I'm always going to be a great teammate. Yeah. You know, even if I don't like, I don't want to, let me get back to football. I don't want to block this guy. Like I want to score a touchdown, but, but not every time my play is going to be called, man. That's just, that's life. That's being part of a team. You don't get to, you don't get all the benefits, the amazing experience of being on a team, but then every play I say, I want the ball. We call those wide receivers, you know? Um, and, and so I was like, that's fine. So I go out there and they do the award. And I thank you. You know, it's like a 10 second speech. I'm out. And then after, um, they introduced me to the, the leadership and they're like, oh man, like great year, da, 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 da. And they're like, hey, when you get back, I want to talk to you. Something exciting, something exciting is going down. I was like, oh, okay. I kind of picked up the body language. I was like, mm, okay. So when I got back, you know, they let me know like, um, hey, we're going public. I was like, fuck 
yeah, let's go. Uh, what does that mean? You know, like, <laughs> I mean, I know what going public means, but like, do I get like money? No, 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 no. Do I get like stock? Nope. What, uh, what, like, they're like, just be under a bigger microscope. Yeah. Like they, you know, more paperwork, more regulation. No, it wasn't, I, you know, I was like, uh, and they're like, well, it opens up capital markets and we get cheaper costs. We can invest in platforms. I was like, okay, I, I, I get down with that. And they're like, but hey, we want to talk to you about something. Like, well, um, your business, it's unique to Collier's uh, in that you're in LA, but my deals were everywhere, right? Like there was a time, it was like a Blackstone JV with DDR. They're like, hey, we got a center in uh, Wisconsin. We got one in Cincinnati and we got one in Georgia. So, you know, three states. And if I had a really good teammate at Collier's in that market, which sometimes I did, like I would generally speaking, like line them up and like, let's go work it together. I wanted, but most markets, they didn't have it. So I just do it myself and I provided high level service, kept getting hired. And then at the time I had brought on some young guys, basically all my younger brother's friends, they had all reached out saying, Hey, can you mentor? Oh, we want to get into real estate. Can you mentor? I was like, yeah, you know, and that's a, that's a different conversation, but like, you know, I had, I had very set principles and, and expectations in terms of like, if I'm going to take time away from my business to mentor, um, here's what I need to see from you. And, um, they were doing net lease. And like, so through that, I was doing a lot of net lease and net leases everywhere. Like you could have a guy in LA who's like, oh, I focus in C stores. I mean, he could close 30 deals in 20 different States. Yeah. So callers came and they said, Hey, it was, I think it was a first service was like a Canadian company and they were building through M&A. They weren't organic. They were growing. They're buying a bunch of companies and just doing PE roll up and then sell to the market at a higher multiple and the money in between is the free money. And they were buying all these like, uh, you know, it's like Houston Realty Advisors. It's like, we do sales, leasing, and management in Houston, one office. Like, and they're like, we don't have a Houston office. So they were buying all these things, but in their negotiations, they were offering them, if I remember correctly, and again, like a lot of concussions here. So it's like, you know, um, exclusive market coverage rights, exclusive market coverage rights, which means any deal in the Collier's network, like we'll go through you and you'll get a percentage of it. Well, they made these agreements with these companies and they never told me that. And they came like, hey, just, as we roll these companies up, you're going to have to start giving a big chunk of your fee to these local. I was like, well, hell no. <laughs> well, it's their market. And I was like, well, no, 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 no. If it was their market, someone like me couldn't come in and earn the business. All right. They're sleeping. Like they are not doing their job. <laughs> if I called an owner on an asset in Houston, Texas, which I, I wasn't like, I was more working on an account. And then they would say, Hey, I have an asset in Houston. Um, the owner would say, hey, Kyle, love you. And in these markets, we'll work with you. But if it's Houston, it's going to be this guy at your company. But I never got that. They never, that, that conversation never took place. And so they were like, well, you're going to have to. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's why Matthews exists. And I said, you like, is the, top, the top producer. They're like, yeah, you know, and you make up 2% of our revenue. We're, we're going to side on the, with the other 98 and they were like, they were super nice. Um, I, again, I'm still very, very close with all of the leadership that was there at the time. But I just said, look, I, this is not only destructive to my business, like, let me put myself in, in with the junior agents that were just kind of coming up in the business underneath my guidance. They didn't have that. Like they couldn't all of a sudden have 30, 40% of every deal out the door, like on a tax, like a fiefdom tax. And so, um, I just said, Hey, I'm going to have to go. And they said, we understand. And then I looked at, you know, okay, CB, jail. It's all the same thing. It's a bunch of little fiefdom silos. Like it's all like, you, oh, if you do, you can't do a deal in this market. If you do, you have to pay this. It's, it's very, it's very different. And, and then everything else was a boutique. I wasn't going to go back to the place I was. That didn't make sense. So I was like, well, you know, I got eight, nine employees. I got, you know, 15, 20 junior eight. I was like, well, you know, I'll just do my own thing. So that when you left, and when started Matthew's office one was in El Segundo. El Segundo, man. You took your, so you started, it wasn't like you in a laptop day one. No, 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 no. So you I, had a full team to, built out the no, day you started. Full team. But the reason for that was because when I went to Collier's, I said, hey, I'm going to go. I'm just going to do my own thing. They said, yeah, we get it. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go to, you know, one of your competitors. Like, it just doesn't make, they, they have the same rules. So they're like, okay, I get it. And they're like, what do you want to do about all these guys? I was like, well, I'd like for them to come with, but I'm not going to. I'm, I don't want to have that conversation without your blessing. And they said, no, we assume they're coming with like, you should talk to them because they don't really have like, they're not going to stay here. Like basically if you leave and and they aren't coming with you, like they're gone, like we're right. going to fire them. And I was like, well, I, obviously I didn't want that. So with 
Collier's blessing, I sat them down and I said, they kind of knew what was going on. Like there were some issues. And I said, hey, listen, here's what's going on. Here's what's happening. I'm going to start this company. Um, they've given me permission to speak with you and love for you guys to, you know, I'm going to go start it regardless, even if it's just me. But if you see value in me and you believe that this is the right decision, love for you to have you at the company. So, um, you know, they gave me whatever, 45 days to, to figure it all out. They call yours threw me a party on the last day. Like it, it was very amicable. We, they kept my call yours email on. Like, I think I had 118 deals under contract. Like Damn. all of them went through, uh, call yours for, for 12 months. Like it was, it was all good. It was all good. It was a very unique situation that I think they realized that because of what they were doing with, we're going public. And it was like, dude, it was a, it was a home run for them. They did, it was, they did everything right. Like either there, there's no judgment. Cause like I would have, I guess done the same thing. Like it, they crushed it. Um, they understood like it was kind of putting me in a tough spot and it was like, I don't want to say collateral damage. It didn't feel like it was just like, Hey, it's just, uh, like I said, not everything's meant to last forever. You hope they do. Yeah. But, um, they're saying, Hey, take your time. Like can't take forever. But, um, the only thing was they, they didn't want any like public announcements, you know, cause they thought it might, you know, cause issues with some of the some of the conversations they were having as they were going public. So, you know, we, I started Matthews April 24th, roughly was their 27th, Monday, the 27th. Um, so that was almost eight years ago to the day. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. It, it's very different and no business plan. Like, yeah, I guess I'm just going to do this. I'm so tempted to want to ask when I hear 118 it. deals, and then you you said that at one point you made three hundred thousand, but then we we never really figured out as a broker the production levels you were able to get up to. But I'm a, I'm assuming yeah, this north, is north of eight figures. Yeah, which See, allowed me to start a company. It's look, Matthews is big now. Yeah, there's no invest outside investment. There's no debt. You didn't raise venture capital Not at a, a single dollar, dude. At a pre seed seven hundred million dollar valuation. Oh well, if that you know <laughs> because I'm an idiot. And I have no background in business. Yeah, if I had known I could do that, can I, can I still do that? You can do that. All right, let's talk. Um, no, 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 no. It just, uh, I had, I like I said, I had been so blessed. Like, God's been good to me, man. Yeah. And, uh, he's been good to my family and my wife and my kids. And But like, we're just talking brokerage. Like, I am the luckiest human being ever. If you look at when I started, where I started the GFC, like, People say, well, you make your own luck. And no doubt, I understand that concept. And I believe like hard work, it's like the harder you work, the luck you get, no doubt. But there are so many little weird things that happen along the way that set up perfectly my, my what I've accomplished that yep. there is no way I can stand in front of anyone and say, I did this. You stand on the backs of giants. That's right. And that's why you, you uh, the only time I'll say I is I founded the company. Like okay. I literally am the founder, okay? But it's all we, us, and our. I, one of our, one of our, uh, we have 12 principles. One of our principles is not I, me, my, it's we, us, are. First principle is Matthews is the team. Second is always produce, always protect your teammates. And so, um, maybe it's football background. Maybe it's just, I don't know. It's just me. Maybe it's how I was raised. It's probably just a little bit of everything. Um, there is no way in hell I could ever be sitting here with you today without the men and women I worked alongside pretty much my entire life at this point, but yep. definitely at Matthews. And um, I think that allows us to have so much fun. Um, it allows us to prank each other and talk shit to each other and do all those fun things. Cause like we've been through the battles and we, you know, we're in, we battle every day. We're still in a battle. How do you, how, how do you, and we talked, I think we talked about it earlier when we were sitting in the conference room. What's the, the line between we're, we're here to, to get shit done and we're not here to play ping pong and foosball in yeah, the office yeah. all day. Yeah. You know, it's said uh, Conor McGregor, we're not here to take part. We're here to, to take, take over. over. <laughs> yeah. That's us. Um, and you are doing that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I let me stupid football analogies. I, th I recognize we've done a lot. I recognize people on the outside. I was like, damn, what the hell? As I, I look at it, like we are backed up on our own goal line. We got a couple first downs. We're moving the chains. <laughs> but we're on our 30 yard line with 70 yards to go. We got so far to get to our destination, the end zone, right? Billion dollar public exit. So you could sit here and say, oh, you've done, well, yeah, sure. I get that, I recognize that. I'm not discounting that we've accomplished a lot, but we are so far away from where we're heading that it doesn't feel like it. It yeah. doesn't feel like it. So 
I got a lot of fire in my belly to keep going. And I know my teammates do. Um, let me get to your question. You said, hey, what is the line between having like, in a paraphrase, having that culture of fun and celebrating success, but then becoming the company that has the beer garden, the ping pong table? Well, first of all, you got to define fun. Yeah. Fun for me is winning. Playing ping pong, I know you could win. It's not winning. <laughs> right. Drinking beer at an office, like what the fuck? That's not winning. But uh, work, but work life balance. Uh, yeah, you are. Yeah. I'm, I'm just teasing That's you. Funny. <laughs> yeah, you tease me. I'll do it. <laughs> like, let's, like, hey, let's go, baby. I'll talk about that. Uh, That's probably, next. No, okay, fine. Um, you know, I just think those are distractions. This is my opinion. Um, I've never seen a brokerage company grow like we have or done what we've done where their value, their value proposition to their agents is like, yo, we got beer gardens and ping pong tables. Yeah. You know what our value proposition is? Our technology, our database, our support, our shared service platform, our culture, the way we push our agents. Like this is a culture of accountability. You want to go do a couple deals, go to, go to any, any other, you want to go drink some beer on a Thursday? Like, Thirsty Thursdays. Thirsty Thursdays. Yeah. You want to play ping pong? Um, okay. Not here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe we'll have a ping pong table, but that's only because we set up a competition and then it was just left there. Like, I don't like, yeah. that's not what we're here to do. We're, this is not a social club. This is not a country club. There are country clubs where you can go play ping pong and beer. Like you got a garage, like set one up, invite your buddies on a Friday night. We are here to be successful and through success, it opens up all the beer and ping pong you want, yeah. but not here. Like we're here to be great. We're here to win. We're here to take over. We're here. Not, we're not here to take part. Like I don't, and guess what? As much as we talk about, Oh, like this generation, there's so, like this generation, like there are still dogs out there. They, you got to work a little harder to find them. That's okay. We go to 156 career fairs a year. I will find those fuckers, you know, yeah, yeah. who, who want, who uh, ready to go. And there are a lot of people at 22, they come out of college and they were told this is what is valuable in a company is like, you know, pet insurance and like <laughs> nap pods. And, uh, you know, that's not us. Yep. Now this is the sales side. These are the agents. We do have operations center in Phoenix. You go into like, which is, you know, 80, 90 employees, like not agents. Right. Um, that office environment is going to be different. They're different. Like what they're, first of all, they're wired different, ment ment like they're creatives. Like it's very different. So I do want to, like, we do have that. It's just agents. You've chosen a career. There is no time for ping pong. Yeah. All right. And you know what? Like there's time for cold calling. You know what there's time for? Getting better, uh, understanding how to communicate your value rep, market research and understanding where market rents are. Um, going on meetings, traveling to present deals in person, going to conferences, that's what there's time for. Because if you, especially at an early age, if you at 22 start doing that and you never give up and you keep going, I am a testament that by the time you're 40, and I know that sounds so old to these young youngsters, but it's not. And uh, it comes quick. And at 40, you could punch your ticket to any life you want. If you want to spend the rest of your life playing ping pong and drinking beer, very probably unfulfilling life, but you can do that. If you want to spend the rest of your life like let's talk about something real, like starting a charity, a foundation and uh, pursuing the rest of your life in philanthropy to find a cure, do something and, and, you know, address a problem that is near and dear to your heart. It sets you up to do that too. And everything in between. All right. You want the big house. If you want to send your kids to private, like whatever it is, you want to spend the rest of your life focusing on your health and wellness. Like it's all there for you, but it all gets set up by those first five, 10, 15 years in a career like brokerage where there is no ceiling. And that's why you choose it. That's why you choose it. You don't choose it because it's easy. You don't choose it because it's fun ripping 500 cold calls a week and basically getting told no on every call if they answer. Um, that's not why you choose it. You choose it because you want to live the life you promised yourself you were going to live when you were a kid. You want to live the life that every night you're laying in bed and you're going to sleep and you dream about living. Whatever that life looks like to you, whether it's a material life, whether it's a metaphorical life, whether it's a conceptual like. And you're willing to do whatever it takes and make however much sacrifice, however long it takes to get there. And there are some people at our company who are 27 years old, making 2 million bucks a year. That yeah. wasn't me. That was not me. I wasn't that good. I wasn't that smart. I worked harder or as hard, but and it didn't, that didn't happen for me. And unfortunately, there are people who are 
five years into their career and they're, you know, they're doing three, four, uh, five years in, you're doing okay. I'm just saying like, but I know one thing for a fact about brokerage is that if you go hard the way we coach at Matthews and the way anyone should, and you do it and never stop, you will get to where you're going. Nobody can, can stop you from your destination. You could have a bad mentor. You could have a tough product type. You could have a terrible market, great financial crisis, and it will slow you down. It will make the road windier and bumpier. It will affect the journey, but it does not ever, ever affect your ability to get to the destination, however you define that. And, and that, the tragedy of my job is I see so many people quit who the hardest part of my job truly is I see what they could be. I see the best version of themselves, but they don't see it. It's not that they don't believe in themselves. They just think it's too far away or they think it's unattainable. I'm not saying anyone lacks for confidence. I'm just saying like, they just don't see the path and I know it's right there. And it it may be 15 years down the road, but I know they're going to get there. When you say there's a 27 year old that's making 2 million bucks a year. And and look, we've talked a lot about this. Anybody that's listened this far has already heard kind of your story, but what are the characteristics of somebody that's 27 years old that's making 2 million bucks? Generally, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Finish. I'm done. Generally speaking, um, the only commonality, the only consistent trait in the dozens and dozens of those that we do have, and this is true about any successful agent at any company I've ever worked at or have had the ability to build a relationship, is the discipline um, of working long hours, making lots of cool calls, presenting lots of proposals. Okay. Over a long period of time. And a proposal is... It's a BOV, yeah. yeah. You'll, you'll hear me use those interchangeably as bad habit, like proposal, I propose you sell your asset, I propose you hire me to lease it, I propose you engage me to provide a service to find you debt. It's, Got it. Uh, the reason we call it a proposal is a BOV is more of an investment sale, and we do more than that. We do debt origination, we do leasing, we do investment sales. We will do more than that very soon, whether it's property insurance or valuation or debt servicing. Um, and that's, that's more of a, you know, that's, that's more of where we're heading. But, um, so a proposal, we could just call it a BOV broker opinion of value for the investment side. And when a, when an agent calls you up and you say, yeah, I'd be interested to see what it's worth and I'll consider selling. So the three things, if you said, give me three traits of a broker, like tell me three things about a broker and I'll tell you if they're going to be successful or not, assuming they keep doing it. Yeah. What time, what time do they get in the office? How many calls do they make and how many proposals do they present? And if I only had one, it'd be presented proposals. That, that is the metric that's that the matters metric. the most. That's the metric. Now, I present 103 proposals before I want to list them. Like that, you know, it's funny, my son struck out in baseball a couple of times the other day and it just, it was, rec- it was just eating his heart out. And I said, hey, listen, man, I get it, dude, it sucks. Like I've struck out in baseball. Hey, what if I told you I struck out 103 times in a row when I started my career? He's like, what? I said, yeah, like, you know, proposals. And he kind of knows the vernacular because He's been sitting at my dinner table for 12 years. Uh, you don't get lucky. I mean, you know, they know all about cold calls. But I said, um, I presented a hundred. And I said, you know what we call it? We call it a pitch. It's a lot like baseball. We call it a pitch. I call them at bats. Got to keep getting at bats. Keep swinging the bat. Eventually you're going to make contact. Eventually you're going to hit it out of the park. I said, I struck out 103 times. And you know what I realized about 50, 60 in? We're not allowed to curse in my house. Like my kids don't curse. I don't curse in my house. I curse here. <laughs> Hopefully we save those for the podcast. Hopefully they don't hear this. <laughs> oh no. Um, but uh, but I said, you just gotta say, you know, F it. If I strike out, strike out. Never accept it, never like it, but just move on. It's okay. You're gonna keep getting better, but you can never keep stepping up into the batter's box. He's like, I don't wanna play this game. I was like, no, you gotta keep going. You gotta keep stepping up. And so if one thing, it, it would be proposals presented. Now, if they presented a hundred, we, our market leaders who run the office, our managing directors who oversee that, and all the way up to me, like this is how involved I am in the, in the company, Chris. I will get on the phone with an agent and I will role play this with them to this day. I mean, we have 500 agents. I think 450 have my cell phone. So sometimes that sucks, but, <laughs> but you know, I can always not answer, but I, I get back to pretty much everyone. Um, and, uh, and I say, okay, you present 100 proposals. I'm sure there's some free pizzas in there. That's okay. But like, uh, free pizzas are proposals that you maybe shouldn't have presented, but you're just trying to justify a reason to do it. Yeah. Um, okay, walk me through. First thing I'm going to say, go back to Matthews University. Matthews University training program. There is a 300 page manual. There are 105 modules. Module 68, the pitch. Well, there's one module, module 64, is the preparation for the pitch. Module 68 is the pitch. And there's a 21 step. Have you just, have you gone back and looked at that? 
like something as simple as you make an agenda for the meeting. You never go to BOV presentation without, hey, Chris, do you have an agenda for this meeting? If not, I presented one. Already you're like, damn, this guy's serious. Okay, here's our, here's my agenda. Nobody does this, right? We do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there, there you go. I just gave away one of our secrets. All our agents are going to be pissed. And like, God, you it. can't do this. It's, it's hard balancing this whole new social media where it's like, <laughs> I got to give them, show them a little leg, but I can't give away the secrets. You got to come to Matthews if you want them. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, there's my plug, but, um, but, uh, I want to come to Matthews. You can, you can, Golly. dude, I invited you. Uh, I know yeah. I'm going to come. All right, good. So, um, so anyway, where was I coming with that proposals? And so I said, start there, but the one you have, your agenda, it's different. You have their agenda, but your agenda, just list the 21 steps and like write out what you're like. Okay. Step four, remember, don't sit across the table, sit to the side. Across is adversarial. I know we're doing podcasts now, yeah. but it'd be better if I'm sitting on your side because that means we're on the same team. We're in a huddle as opposed to negotiation. You don't want to negotiate with your client. You want to negotiate with the buyer. You want to be on the same, like just little things that I picked up on over the years. It's all there at Matthews University. Go back to your training, dog. Like, and then like, okay, I said, now I want you to do this for the next 10. Do this exactly like this. And I, we're going to do this call again. You're presenting, you know, one and a half a week, two a week, two weeks, great. I've never seen someone present two BOVs a week consistently and not do insanely well. And so what's that? Five, six, seven weeks. All right, let's come, let's call back 60 days from now. We're going to put this, I'm, I have my assistant, put it on, put it on the calendar and, and I'm going to see how it goes. And every time they're like, dude, it's so different. So different. It's like, that's it. That's it. It's, 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 it's a simple business brokerage. It's not an easy one, but it's a simple one. Did you, did you draft that? We, every single thing we drafted. And you just, just, just got started. it all out of your listen, head. Listen, listen, you know what, like, you know what we did during COVID was a March 17th. We went home. March 18th, I called up like the top 10 guys. I said, we're not going to sit around our ass for the next however many months or years. I said, I need, I want to revamp this training. We got to bring like Matthews University. I got this whole vision. And um, we started banging them out. And, it, and at the time, I think it was about 80 lessons. I wrote about 30 of them. Dave wrote 15, 20, and then other people had four or five. And um, a great quick story there is uh, I would say, all right, you got two weeks each of these and send them back to me. And they'd send them to me. And I'd say, Bill or Max or whoever was, like, is this the best you can do? And they're like, <laughs> I said, you can come back to me in a week. They come back to me in a week. I was like, Max, man, Bill, Chad, this is the best you can do. And they go, so you got another week because our training class was coming in June. So now it's like early May and they sent it back and all of them individually, they said, Kyle, this is the best I can do. And I said, good, then maybe I'll read it this time. <laughs> that was a great lesson. Kennedy, Pola, Kennedy. You know, I, I did this to the market leaders. So to answer your question, um, we we revamped our entire, wrote everything from scratch. It's, you know, now it's 105 modules. It has, it is, it is, um, it's live training throughout the summer. So Matthews University will have uh, June 5th. We have 200 people showing up. Um, half of them are new agent hires. Another half are interns, usually rising seniors. Cause that, that, that very much we like to become our recruiting class for the next year, like kind of like a law, like summer, summer program. And we train them all. You know, some of the interns don't come back. That's fine. They go into real estate and they speak highly of us, I hope. But, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been amazing. And, um, that was during COVID and we, I just, we just battled to do it. And then, um, you know, about five weeks in, I was like, we're getting back in the office. Then early May, May 4th, I drove from Nashville to Dallas and I opened the office personally. And then if I'm there, everyone's got to show up. So yeah. we got back to work right away. And I think that was one of the biggest reasons we flew out of that thing. And like we were balling. And to this day, especially the big public companies, because they, you know, they got a lot of distractions. Hell yeah. Politically, culturally, they got a lot of distractions right now. And I don't, we are, we don't, we have no distractions. We just work. Yep. And so, um, uh, they're still struggling to get people in the office. Like there's still maybe 50, 60% occupancy. It's a joke. We've been a hundred, we've been 101% since really June, 2020. And, and again, that Matthew's mentality, if we hire the right guys and gals, they couldn't imagine, they, they don't want to work from home. They did that for five weeks and they hated it. I, I, could you imagine being at the top of your game, yeah. but saying, no, I'm no, not gonna, in our I'm business. I'm going to take this one from I, home. I am open-minded that there are professions, let's say coding, let's say maybe account, like an account where 
not driving 30 minutes in the office, like I, I creating the efficiencies, like let's assume you don't have a bunch of young kids. If you got young kids in your house, it's, I mean, it, it's not a good environment for being locked in. Okay. But I, I, I am open-minded that there are, there are multiple professions and jobs where that makes sense. Not in brokerage, not in sales. And, you know, I always say like, it's like a company is like a band. Like everybody could play their instrument in a separate room, but it's only music when it's done together. Um, on that note, you started with one, I think one of the most impressive things about you and, and about the company in general is, especially you though, you've gone from broker to really CEO and like business leader. So you said you don't do brokerage anymore. I do no brokerage. Y'all now have 19 offices and counting. D- this is true. 19. We counted them all off this morning. I counted them off at the top of my head. Yes. Uh, Cause you were like, Hey, what do you got? 15. I was like, uh, uh, six months ago, we might, but you know, but yeah, every day there's a new office. So yes, 19 offices. How, how do you just speak a little bit? Let's bring it home on like, what are y'all doing differently? How do you determine when to start a new office? Like why is Matthews and, and you can hear it why it's different, but you mentioned technology, shared services, support, and then you're, it seems like you're opening an office a month now. So what's like the vision? Where are we headed? What, what's all yeah, this look uh, like? Okay. So there's a lot I of questions in there. Five questions. Y- yeah. In let me um, unpack that. So what is, what is Matthews you do differently? What is what we call our value of representation? And a lot of our value to the broker is just passed through through an owner. So I use these interchangeably. It's, it's really three things. Okay. The first, and I'll, I'll dive into each. The first is our shared service platform. Okay. Okay. The second is our tech stack, our technology. Really, technology creates efficiency. So efficiency through technology. And the third is a culture. We've talked a lot about that. And um, and I'll touch on that again. Okay. Um, and so the first is a shared service platform. So what does that mean? And and I actually I think I talked spoke about this briefly earlier. When I was at other companies, and, and it is my understanding this is still a thing, is a significant chunk of my day as an agent was spent on non-RPAs, non-revenue producing activities. I was I'm researching a property. Okay, that's fine. You know, our own, our agents will still research if it's efficient, but I didn't have a button or a person like, hey, here's these five properties. Can you just get me the contact info? I'm, I'll cold call them. Clearly, I'll cold call them. Cold call is not a problem. I just need the numbers. There was no one there for me to do that. So I had to do that. Okay. Starting with that, that's like the base. Um, but then I generate a BOV. And again, there is part of brokerage that you never get away from. Which comps to use? Which ones are relevant? How? Where do I price it? If I'm underwriting it, what what are the market's five-year unlevered IRR expecta- uh, expectations? What are the assumptions? Can I defend them? Okay, that's fine. But what about building that model? Literally, like for us, it was like Argus. Just creating that model took two, three hours. And I was doing a proposal in a half a week and I'm in shopping. I had to do that myself, right? Then it was, um, it was uh, the, the, the marketing of the BOV. It was the, the production of the, yeah. the, of the InDesign file. Like I, I had, I paid Adobe for my InDesign, you know, and I'm at like a big company, but this is just, this is how it was. So credit to them. They, they probably had pretty good margins, but you know, it's like, okay, but this is just time and my attitude. And as a founder, I was like, well, dude, I mean, so the analogy I use is Aaron Rodgers, best quarterback. Okay. That's not an analogy. That's a fact. So A-Rod, <laughs> that's my guy. Um, he's a great quarterback because he only spends time as a quarterback. Yeah. when he's not doing his darkness retreats. Like he's only like, he's working out, he's throwing the spiral, he's um, he's watching film, he's he's getting with his coach, but he's not coordinating the halftime meals. He's not negotiating room blocks for the away game hotels. He's not like, you know, understanding payroll services for all the security. Like he's just a quarterback. And I looked at myself like, I'm a player, I'm on the field, I'm an athlete for brokerage. And I'm doing all this work that like, it's, it's a distraction. And so, um, at Matthews, 90% of that is gone. So at Matthews, yes, a lot of our guys will still research numbers, but like, if, if there's just a number, you like click a button, we have a data research department. So they both onshore and offshore, they'll find the number and they'll kick it back to you. Okay, cool. That saves me four minutes. Great. Well, it's four minutes. That's another cool call. Um, how about, how about like the BOV production? If it's a larger deal, we haven't, I mean, we have 60, 70 people in Phoenix that like they click a button in the system. And I'll talk about the system Atlas in a second where it, it sends a message to say, Hey, BOV requested. This is the agent. This it's a, 
it's a 15 unit uh, light industrial deal in Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, BOV's due in 10 days or seven days or four days and like different urgency levels. You're talking dirty to me. Yeah. yeah 15 yeah. units in Fort Worth. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so all of a sudden they start creating the whole wireframe. They're already starting on the, on the, the market overview and the submarket overview. They're already doing the ground area photography through our network. They're already doing everything. The broker's just kind of identifying, okay, here, the, it's all done in the system. So the broker just drops comps in the system. He says, start pricing here. Um, we have analysts like, Hey, maybe it, nah, do I, yeah, I'll do a 10 year cash flow model. Like not only do they not have to do it themselves, they don't have to manage these people. They're professionally managed. They're employees at Matthews. It's just done. It's done. It's expensive for us. So our margins are less on any one deal, but our agents do so many more deals. That's why our Matthews agents, why the young agents of Matthews are, are moving up the ranks a lot faster than any other company. That's why we put more new agents into the industry than probably ever the company combined over the last five years. I don't know that, but I would probably bet my money on that. And, um, or the OM, you earn the listing. You're, you're awarded the listing. And you get, you're like, Hey, I need an OM that's done for you. Right. It's all these, there's transaction managers. Like it's, it's, it allows them just to keep making calls and keep going on meetings and keep presenting proposals and keep traveling to see clients, keep negotiating their deals. So they do more deals or, you know, I'd like to think, but they take half that time and they, they go work out and go hang with their buddies. But like half the time they apply back, it's still a net plus to us. It's kind of like, it's not Costco, but it's like Costco's like, look, we'll make less money on any one bottle of water, but we'll sell way more water, right? right? And so the shared service platform, it's, it allows them to generate more business, number one. Number two, it saves them time having to do it. Number three, it saves them time having to manage people. I had to manage people at the companies I was at. Let me ask you, when you hire your first employee, um, and what's your, what's your maternity policy? What happens if they're driving to take a photo of a building that you're pitching on and they get in a car accident? That, these are real things, okay? What happens, oh, you gotta review them. You gotta onboard them. You gotta create the job description. It's all you and it's all distractions, none of which are revenue producing activities. Yep. All of which I had to do at both companies I was at. And if I had to guess, 90% of brokers are still doing. Then the last part, I had to pay for it. That was the hard part. Because then you have to decide like, should I pay to send this out via constant contact, 150 bucks, or could I just like call buyers locally? And that affects owners. That affects the service you're providing. Because now you're you're saying, could I get away with selling this deal without having to spend all this capital on it? Well, the owner, respectfully, I'm sure they want you to make more money, but they're like, look, you need to provide me the best service possible. You need, which ultimately is exposure. Okay. Amongst many things, but the biggest thing is you're you're effectively showing up for a marketing assignment and your job is to expose the asset. All right. And, you know, defend the sunscreens and negotiate and all those things, but get exposure. And now you're deciding if you really want to use all the tools and resources that are available for a broker because you got to pay for them. That's taken out of the decision making process. Matthews is just there. Yeah. Like, bang. Like, so that's the first is a shared service platform. And all of those, let me real quick features, 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 benefit, benefit to the owner. When you hire a Matthews agent, they have more time to call buyers, they have a broader reach and exposure. Okay. Um, they ultimately just can, how would I say this? They can provide you a better service because they have more time to provide the service, which is brokerage. Right. Right. And so let's say all brokers are the same. They all work the same amount of time. They all make, but if one broker has 90% of his time to go out and find you that buyer, who's going to pay the most aggressive price or find you the deal that you're really looking for, for your 1031 and the other broker has 60% of their time, over a long enough period of time, over enough brokers and over enough deals, the company that provides that is is likely over time going to provide a better service. Um, the second is the technology. And I'll say this is a big one. The biggest part about it is the database. But first I'll touch on, we have investor predictor. So any buyer that comes to our website, we cookie, we track their computer. This is a little above my pay grade. We have like a whole software development team at Matthews and, um, and uh, you know, some CIA shit. <laughs> but uh, no, no, no. So, so, all right, you go to our website first. They, your co- company has your, your computer has ISP. We start, okay. It's connected to your profile. I could go in at any time, see like, okay, he's looked at, he's looked at industrial deals in these three markets, right? That's proactive. But what if I told you when I list an industrial deal in Phoenix, it provides me investor predictor. Here are the likely buyers. In addition to people who own near the area, in addition to the email blast, in addition to going on Coastar and seeing who bought buildings similar to it. Here is a list of people based on digital 
body language, digital activity. Here's a list. So if I'm going to make a hundred random calls to buyers, why not this one? And so it increased the probability of sourcing buyers. Um, the needs and leads marketplace, like uh, our agents. And again, I'm not saying these are unique to Matthews. I think some are, some aren't. Needs and leads, it's, um, I'm talking to you, I'm an agent. You say, hey, I'm really looking for industrial, you know, 10 to 20 million in these 10 states. Okay, great. I only, I'm an agent, let's say in Nashville, I'm only working Tennessee. I, I don't, I can't track it, but I, I create this needs and leads in our marketplace. Anytime any deal hits the system in Matthews, it pushes it to me and it pushes it to the listing agent. The listing agent is going to receive, hey, Kyle Matthews, agent out of Nashville, um, has a buyer with a need that matches your lead and vice versa. And you could put listed deals. You can even put unlisted deals. You could say, hey, I have an off-market deal. It's an industrial deal. It's um, you know X amount of square feet, X amount of million, and it's in this market. And it pushes it to the buyer's agent who says, hey, there is a deal, it's an off-market deal put in the system by an agent in our Phoenix office that matches your need for Chris Powers. Yep. And so it just increases probabilities of, of hitting that. Um, click to sell system. When I was an agent and I would send uh, broker emails out, or sorry, e-blast, e e like whether it's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people, I hope they got it. I had no idea. I hope they called me. I'd call them if they're kind of logical buyer, but there was no way to see on the other side, what was happening digitally, right? Our technology embedded within our system is you get real-time alerts. So if I send out an e-blast and it's a multifamily asset, I'm, I'm the listing agent, I get notified within, I think it's like 31 seconds of someone opening, clicking, downloading, depending on how you set your, your filters. Like I only want to see who downloads it. And in the first couple of hours, I might get 100, 200, 300 leads. It says like, hey, Joe Smith at Smith Multifamily Ownership Company is looking at your deal and has all their contact. And I call and I say, hey, Joe, it's Kyle Matthews. Hey, listen, I just sent you a deal. I think you might be looking at like, I love this deal and I think it's perfect for you. And here's why. It gives me the ability to overcome their objections in real time, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like walking onto a car lot. What happens? The sales guy comes out and says, hey, I see you looking at this car. I like this car. You want to test drive it? It's pretty good. And then I'm like, <laughs> no, it's too expensive. Like, no, 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 no. Actually, it's way less expensive than you think. I got this incredible, just for you, I got this incredible, um, take it off the lot now, financing deal. Just come on inside. Let's sit down. I'm going to walk you through the financing. Zero APR for the first 18 months. <laughs> you know, and, and again, like, so it just gives us the opportunity to overcome those objections. Objections are like cement. You got to get to them before they settle. Right. It's hard to crack it after that. And then the biggest thing and the biggest thing and the biggest thing is the size of Atlas, our database, right? Atlas was the Titan God who held the world on his shoulders, right? Atlas, this is, we, you hold, like it holds our business up on its shoulders. This is the biggest, one of the biggest misconceptions about brokerage is owners like yourself. You think, am I in this database? Oh yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, oh man, if you're not, we were like, I, I should quit my job. We suck, I'm out. Oh, 100%. I mean, we have a million people, north of a million people. Wow. All right, here's what's up. Most owners think that companies, our competition, have these databases and they don't. They don't. You say, okay, like what are the biggest companies? Name them. JLL, CB? Security. Nah. Cushman? Nope. Nope. Colliers? Nope. Marcus does? Nope. Oh no, they make their agents do it. Because you talk to any new agent at Marcus and like, what do you do in the first year? Like, got to build my database, but it's their there proprietary you one. You, yeah, okay. Um, so, so, so the bigger companies, you know what I mean? Didn't do you do I know what I, you mean? I live, <laughs> come on, dog. I live that life. Are you, do I know what you mean? <laughs> uh, all right. Listen, some of these companies, the big publicly traded, they may have a database, but it's all like giant institutional owners. Yeah. It's like, you know, in the industrial, it's three, 400 biggest industrial owners. Or if it's like the DFW market, it's the 30, 40 biggest owners. Like, you know how I know this? Cause I got boys at all these companies and I'm like, yo, you know, when you get a listing, like, what do you do? It's like, yeah, we send it to our Excel list. I was like, you don't have a dad. He's like, there kind of is, but nobody uses it. Nobody curates the data. Nobody puts it in. And he's like, there is no private client information, none. And that's why they can't, they struggle to source 1031 buyers. But like now, if you, if you have a $70 million asset, industrial deal in Dallas, multifamily deal in LA, retail deal in De Georgia, how many buyers really are there? It's like 50, 60 buyers. And it's the same buyers. You know who they are. Like, maybe every now and then some new fund shows up, right? But again, like it's out there on the, like you're going to see the deal. 
But who pushes value for the five, the 10, the 15 product? It's those 1031s, it's those private clients. They don't have anything. You, you mentioned Marcus. So I, again, it's been a decade since I've been there. So I, you know, I have to qualify this saying things that may have changed. They haven't. It's that I... I had my database. When I earned a listing, it went out to my, and I I was like, I got a big database. I got like 20,000 people, right? I had eight, nine years databasing me the whole time. Every morning, f- five researches a day, keep the doctor away. So like every morning I got at six and from six to seven, I researched five new contacts. All right, this is all me. It was, it was tough. It was like 20,000. I was like, oh, I got a 20,000 person database. Now at Matthews, your first day, million. North of America. And everybody has access to it. Everyone has access to it. Now there's all types of rules. Like there's protections, there's locks. The biggest is segmentation. Like you're not going to get an eight unit apartment building in New York city because you've never signed up. Like there's, you know, you have form capturing. You could say, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. But my point is if ultimately I'm an agent, I'm interviewing for an assignment and you're like, Hey, how, how do you expose this asset? Look at this thing. Like, yes, I know, you know, I research every owner in DFW. I know who they are. I'm going to cold call them. Of course, of course they're going to get it. And you know what? There's a 60, 70% chance that's the buyer. Stand on the rooftop of the deal you listed, 60, 70% chance the buyer owns a building that you can see. That's like an old school rule of brokerage. I still think that's true. But the 20, the 30, 40% of buyers that are new, it's their first time buying into a market. It's the California 1031 exchange. But how are you going to- The best buyer how, that ever was. They're the best. But how are you going to source them? At every other company, it's uh, LoopNet, it's Crexy, it's it's my internal broker referral network. But, you know, it's like I'm going to put it in our insider system, and, and my 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 agent, the agents at the company in California, they're going to take your deal, which probably has a lot of objections. You have big rents, you have full occupancy. It's like it's there's no upside, all downside, right? And I have to overcome those objections. You're going to rely on an agent six states away who probably doesn't even do their product to be the first person to introduce your product to that magical buyer, that's a bad decision. I want my agent to introduce it. I want my agent to, you know why? Because they're the most qualified. They know the asset the best. They know the market rents the best. They know what the objections they've had time to prepare. And it increases the probability that when that buyer receives a deal, they're not going to be like, delete, not interested. No, I don't like this. And so this, the size of this database, it's an insane listing or earning of a listing tool. Cause you get to go to an owner and say like, if we're just here to talk about marketing and reach, like here's what I say. I, I call it, do you remember the Pepsi challenge? Like, it's like, all right, let's drink the two sodas. You tell me. It's like, I always say Pepsi challenge it. I, I tell the agents, tell the owner to come into the Matthews office, sit at your desk and have access to this thing for a second and understand the power at your fingertips. And then, and just say, Hey, if I hire you, are you able to send this deal to every potential buyer that anyone's ever spoken with? And you could look them in the eye and say, yes. Now go to another competitor and say, another broker shop and say, hey, sit down at their desk, say, hey, if I hire you, I know you're going to send it to everyone you've talked to and everyone you've researched, but can you send this directly to everyone in the market who's ever interacted with anyone at your company? They'd be like, what are you talking about? No. What? What? Why? How? It's like, okay. And then here's the second part of that, Chris show up at 6.30 in the morning at a Matthews office. Everyone will be there, suited and booted, ripping, ready to go. Show up at any Matthews office. Now, show up at a competitor's office at 7.30 in the morning, doors are fucking locked. (laughs) No one's there. (laughs) And that's the third part. See how I tie that together? Culture. Culture, we talked about a lot of culture about keeping it fun, okay. No, I'm talking the culture of work, work ethic. But I thought work-life balance and like yeah, you, you want to get to this question and and all the colleges yeah. are telling their kids, you know, you need to work hard and so not too hard though. So I um I have a theory on the work. I'm just like, laying the softball yeah, right yeah, out yeah, here yeah. for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my favorite answer. This is where Zach wants me to say, go to my social media and you can see for yourself. I know. I retweeted uh, it. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um. I don't think it's that colleges or professors, some do, sure, (laughs) spouses and promotes work-life balance, like don't work that hard, all right? I think what it was, was when we were growing up, half the room was like, I need to be successful and I I wanna go take over the world, da, 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 like maybe maybe that's us, okay? And the other half didn't, and that's okay, because again, God makes everyone different. But I think 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, I think, the other half that's like, hey, I just want to get a job. 
want to make a little money and I just want to, you know, and which again, there's no judgment. It's just different. It's different. I think back then they just were quiet and they were like, Hey, they looked at guys like you and I was like, those guys are crazy. Why would they want it? I don't want that. And we were like, that's cool. You do you. And they just said, and you do you. And, and we, 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 we go our separate ways in life in the sense we choose different paths. I think the issue now in, in our culture, in our society is that other half of the room is so loud. And not only do they say, Hey, I don't agree with that life of like 80 hours a week. Like that's miserable. You work to li- you live to work. Like fine. I, I have things about your choices that I could say, but like, I'm kind of like live and let live. Like you live your life. I live mine. But nowadays that other 50%, they, they just scream at you and they're like, you're, you're, this is bad. And they just drip with judgment and they just can't stand you for it. And I think, cause internally it makes them feel guilty. It makes them feel bad that they're not choosing that because they know deep down that if they were willing over a long period of time to make that sacrifice and put to the side the thirsty Thursdays, like, okay, <laughs> no, put to the side all the the hobbies and the social activities that that's what you really give up. From 22 to 35, I worked nonstop. That's all I did. Was it? I got married. I had three kids. Now I got four, three kids. I went on tons of vacations. I coached my kids sports. So it wasn't all that I did. But what did I sacrifice? I did not sacrifice my life. I did not sacrifice my marriage. I did not sacrifice my kids, my time with my kids. You know what I sacrificed? Some workouts. I got a little soft around the belly. I'm still working on that. <laughs> I sacrificed there's Saturdays or for the boys. I sacrificed, you know, hobbies and and things that you like to do, but you really don't need to do. So the rest of my life, I can do those whenever and wherever I want, if that's what I want to do, which right now, that's not what I want to do. I want to keep spending time with my family and I want to keep kicking ass. And all the people that didn't sacrifice and did Thirsty Thursdays forever are now 35. It's no longer cool to be social all the time. They're like, fuck, now I got to get started. But yeah, and then that's Or they don't. And that's demoralizing. And I'm generalizing here, which I really don't like to do, but now they're pissed and they're angry and they're just, they're screaming at us. I hear you. Okay. Now I, um, yeah, I did a video. No, I did a talk. It was a university of Alabama. And by the way, I've given this speech like a thousand times at Matthews. Like the Matthews guys roll their eyes. Like, Oh, here we go. Work-life balance. I've heard this one. Um, but, uh, now that I have social media, um, it was, uh, you know, it was a pretty act- active post is like someone it was a video, um, where I was talking about a conversation, I, I there was a reporter in LA when I was living out in LA, uh, I think it was an LA Business Journal, would want to come and talk about Matthews. We had started a couple of years, we're growing quick and I was telling her my hours, I get in the office at 545, I stayed till 7, 730. I have at the time, you know, probably two kids, I coach their sports and she's like, oh my God, like when do you have time for work-life balance? Like you're doing all this at the company and then you got the kids, like when do you have time for you? Like work-life balance? And I was like, well, and I'm just, I'm just rolling. I'm just making stuff up. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> like, this is not something I practiced. And I said, well, like work life balance or work day balance. And I was like, I think you're talking about like work day balance. And right now I don't have any. And I said, but work life balance, I'll have way better balance than you do. And like, you know, I have like no filter and she's like, huh? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, work day balance. Certainly right now, like I wake up, I go to work, I go home, I put my kids to bed, talk to my wife, go to sleep. Rinse, wash, repeat, weekends. Um, I coach my kids. I play with my kids. And if it's nap time, I go to the office. Like, yeah, it's brutal. It's hard. Spartan lifestyle, right? <laughs> All time, train for war. So, um, but I'm doing this. So one day, if God willing and the creek doesn't rise, like I will have the luxury of not ever having to work again at a young age. And that that's my hope. I don't like hope. That's my strategy. Eh, strategy's good. That's what I know to be true. I know that if I do this, it will work out. And I might be an idiot. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. So that's my choice. And I said, so right now, yes, your your day is more balanced. Like you work like eight hours a day, right? So yeah, I said, then you, you know, you, what do you do for hobbies? Like I, you know, I go to yoga and I spend time. I said, no, that, that's what I figured. I said, so right now, yes, I work more than you. But I said, work-life balance is a myth. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because from 22 to 32, I'll work eight hours a week. From 32 to you know, 35, 37, I think I was, I'm trying to do the math here. Yeah. Like, I'll work 60. And from 37 to 42, I'll work 20. And then at 42, I'm done. And so add that up, like the hours per year, 50 work weeks in a year. And then for you, take 
you know, 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year is 2,000 hours times 40 years because you'll probably have to work that long um, unless your parents give you a bunch of money, which I ain't getting that, you know? So um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, um, that's 80,000 hours. And then when I added up mine, I, did, I had a whiteboard because I always have a whiteboard because the whiteboards are awesome. And I, I um, <laughs> mine was like 68,000. And I said, so you're going to work more than me. It sounds like you don't have work-life balance. I do. And she wasn't happy about that. But, um, but it kind of taught me is like, it was, uh, you know, I just always try and break things down to like the facts. I don't like to state opinions as facts. So I was just like, here are the facts and like convince me otherwise. She's like, well, I'm, I'm, I can't. And I was like, there you go. And it just kind of like, I've always shared that story. And I shared that story at the university of Alabama at the real estate school. I was you know, giving a talk to about a month ago. And, um, yeah, look, it's delayed gratification. Yep. You know, the first sign of maturity in kids is delayed gratification. You go to a three-year-old and you say, hey, you could have a cookie today or two tomorrow. And they'll always choose one today. And then they'll ask for one tomorrow. Yeah. You because know? <laughs> they're three. And they'll probably get it. You go to a five-year-old and you say, you could have one today and two tomorrow. I have four kids. Two of my kids would have taken the one and two of my kids would have taken the one tomorrow. And they did kind of, but by seven, they almost all take the two tomorrow because they're maturing and they're thinking, wait a minute, if I just sacrifice a little today, if I sacrifice this cookie, which I want so bad right now, Tomorrow I get two, I can do that. That's one day. Now, when it comes to your career and professional success, it's a much longer sac sacrifice, but there's a lot more cookies at the end, you know? Yeah. And so that's what I tell these guys and gals when they start at Matthews, I share with anyone who's willing to listen, like God willing, life is long actually. And you got to plan for that. You, you know, there's tragedies that, that, that happen every day and they're terrible. Okay. Put that to the side. But what if you do live 80, 90, hundred years old? Like what if, like, especially every day people are, you know, more better access to health or like awareness about food and da, da, da. Like what if 50, 60, 70, like you still are in great shape. You could still do a lot of things. You're not sitting in a chair watching like Fox news the rest of your life. Like, you know, it's like, no, you actually could do things like, what if you're still working, man? Like that, sucks. And like, and you're working, but you're not really building wealth because things are getting, things are always expensive. They're getting more expensive by the day, like inflation. I know CPA was down to five, thank God. <laughs> but, um, of course, CPI is still, you know, still hanging in there. But, uh, yeah. but my point is, it's like, what are you really giving up in your twenties and even your early thirties? Like I, you can find the, you, your life partner and get married. You can, you can have children and be an involved mother and father. You can do these things. What you sacrifice, you sacrifice, you know, some workouts, certainly you sacrifice like your, your time, like socializing, but those things fade. Those are like hobbies and activities. Like, and then for the, so the rest of your life, if you make those sacrifices up front and you delay the gratification, the amount of socializing, the amount of working out, the amount of whatever you want in life. And maybe it's a material thing. Maybe it's, you know, boats and cars and like, Hey, to each their own. That's not my scene, but like, God bless, man. Whatever brings you happiness. Like I, I got a rule, like do whatever makes you happy as long as it's not pissing anyone else off. You know, it's like, if that's what makes you happy, that's awesome, man. That's yeah. awesome. But it, 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 there has, it has to come from somewhere. And the thing with sacrifice is much like wealth of compounds in the sense, like if you can do it earlier, it will build and build and build and build. And I think, I think it's not so much that they're being encouraged by like, the establishment, the institutions, certainly there are those professors, but there are always those professors, right? It's more that like the other side of the room, the room that doesn't want to do that through social media is seeing the benefits of those who did. And it's just getting thrown in their face every day and they're pissed off and they're angry. And what do people do? They very rarely reflect internally and say, well, what choices did I make in my life that led me to this place where I'm not, I'm not necessarily living the life I want, but instead now they're projecting it out and it's becoming part of the culture where if you say, hey, if I go to 22 years about to graduate, hey, what do you want? And if, 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 if he or she went to their uh, fellow classmates, like, you know what? I want to be super successful. I want to make a ton of money. I want to retire young and just, you know, and just do all the things I want in life. They're like, oh my God, that's terrible. Like, and it's like, no, that's just what that person wants. They're not judging you, like, but it's just for whatever reason. Um, so in my little... The soapbox that I stand on, I just battle that message a little bit. And that's my thoughts on work-life balance. I love that thought on work-life balance. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to hit on it. All right. 
we've been going for a while. Let's bring it home on just a little bit about what you're seeing in the market. Like what are what are you telling agents? What are you actually seeing? Uh, you actually think maybe the worst of it might be past us. Um, well, let me clarify it. Speaking from a brokerage standpoint with velocity declines. Okay. And I'll tell you, so I'll tell you why, is velocity declines for a brokerage company or an individual agent, you want all your clients to make money at all times. It's always better when they do, okay? But in terms of your market, it's really the market conditions for transactions, all right? And and what happened was last year when Powell and the Fed went on that, you know, was it nine, nine, nine raises in 12 months and it went from zero to four and a quarter, four and a half. Mm. And the 10 year went from, you know, what, 130 in February to 420 in October. I mean, think about that. In eight months, it went up almost 300 basis points. I'm going to use generic numbers here. Um, let's say February last year, like coming out of 2021, which is the most insane year ever, right? Um, heading into 2022, big pipelines, everyone's just feeling good about themselves. Let's say the average cap rate across all product types is a five and the average cost of capital debt was a three and a half. You follow just like real simple, yeah. 150 basis points with amortization, your debt constant is close to your cost of cap, is close to your yield, the cap rate that you're buying in. So, you know, with four, five, sixes, that's kind of a stabilized cash and cash. That's fine. I'm just using this as a base. When debt rises, when the cost of borrowing rises 300 basis point, 3% from three and a half to six, six and a half on average, but your cap rate's still at five, nothing pencils and transactions. Once that 1031, like kind of pig in the snake is swallowed, like it's gone. And you see velocity crash, you know, it's like, I think December was down 77% or that was in November. I mean, that's significant. And so what we're seeing now, and this is why I think the worst is over from a transaction velocity standpoint, is we are seeing massive cap rate movement. It is happening. Like, you know, September, October, we hadn't seen it yet. There still was some kind of crazy sales, but November, December, Jan, now you're seeing them. You're like, damn, that deal traded like a high six. It would have traded mid five last year. You're like, dude, that was out of seven. You're starting to see sevens. I was like, there's a seven. I haven't seen that since like <laughs> 2015. Like, let's go, baby. You know, come on. Like, especially buyers, you know, it's like, oh, I've been waiting around forever. It's like, all right, well, your cost of borrowing has gone up. Your cost of LP money has gone up. It's all relative. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You make your money on the buy in the market you're buying in, all right? Right. But, but, but we're seeing cap rate movement, but we've also seen debt costs, you know, kind of stabilize, like, and come down a little bit. I mean, you know, it peaked was October 24th, 10 year was at 420. Today it's 340, 350. I didn't check today. It's kind of moving around a little bit, but that's 60, 70 basis points. I think debt's 25, 50 bips cheaper than it was. There's less lenders in the market today, but there's still some lenders. So um, that's why it's so important to have, we have embedded capital markets agents at our, at, in, our, in our company, which is so important if you're an investment sale guy. But um, so now we're seeing cap rates moving up. We're seeing debt stabilize, even come down a little bit. We're getting a little closer to what I call market e equilibrium, where cap rates on average are 150 bips higher than debt. If debt is six and a half, I know this sounds crazy. Cap rates got to get to eight. They got to go from five to eight, but they're moving. They're at six, six and a quarter. Six, they're, they're marching. And as long as they will keep marching up because buyers are undefeated, they've never lost this battle. All sellers either don't sell or the ones that have a real motivation, they always have to find religion and sell. So I have to ask you one question. Yeah. For the folks right now, you can go on and a lot of the single tenant stuff, dollar generals, whatever, still price at five and a quarter. They're not and selling. And, but if, okay, so that, that, that has finally kind of washed out. Yeah, it's washing out. Okay. Yeah. So those are just brokers that are willing to take listings at five and a quarter. And yeah, yeah, bad brokers. Um, historically, they haven't been through a difficult market. Even guys who started really 2011, COVID was like a stop start. It does. It wasn't even like a real recession for brokers. Just there were no deals for 90 days, and it came back like wildfire. So you have brokers in the business 10 years, 12 years almost, making millions, and millions, and millions. They have never been in a market like this, and they're learning hard lessons. And they probably have big overhead too at the household. Yeah, yeah. I think I think most of their overhead. It sounds weird. Is is assets they've purchased. They they're super liquid. They make all this cash, and as soon as they get the cash, they go buy buy real estate, and they become a liquid. Um, but they have assets. But now you know the value of those assets are going down. I, I think they're okay. Um, you know, I can't speak for everyone. I can speak for agents at Matthews. Like it's not part of Matthews University, like uh, wealth management. But we certainly communicate like 
be conservative, be safe, stay liquid. We always recommend you have 24 months of of your whatever your nut is saved up in in cash or cash equivalent. Buy real estate, fund your 401k, do all those things. Uh, we all, you know, we tell brokers one of the best ways to earn business is invest with your, you know, if your client's raising money, put some money in as an LP. Like it gives you a good shot of winning the business. You know, yeah. if it's a product you specialize in. They appreciate it. Yeah. Um. Uh, anyway, that regardless, um, it's uh, those are agents that are um, they're just uh, and, and I don't mean this disparaging. Like they just haven't had to be. They're just not. They're not battle season vets yet. Yeah. The vets aren't doing it. Yeah. They'll, they'll just not take the listing. They'll have it come back to them on the rebound and lower price. Oh, they'll just move on to higher probability. It's, it's probably, uh, it's, it's probability brokerage. I will tell you as a principal right now, uh, which is, it's been a flip for a long time. You know, everybody wants the off market deal, the true off market, no offense, but no brokers involved. I just want to talk directly to mm-hmm. now in this market, it's totally changed. If a if a broker is bringing a deal out and they're a good broker, they've already brought they've, the seller down to already, earth. Listen, bad markets, uh, a really hard transaction markets reset broker value. Correct. Time. I, so there are so many developers that we had done a lot of business, but like first of all, it starts with fee compression. You know, your fees go from three to two to one on like a chunkier, let's call it just a commodity, like a net lease, right? Yeah. And then eventually, they're like, dude everybody knows what product I got. Like they could just reach out. Like I don't even need to list this. And in a market like 21, I, I will always battle say a broker will get you a better, better price. And even if they don't, they'll save you time. Like I always say, okay, what's the fee you're going to pay? It's 50 grand, 70 grand, hundred grand. How much is your time worth? How much aggravation? Like, you know, I'm always going to battle, right? I believe in what we're doing. But in today's, like we have developers reaching out like, Hey, like I need someone to help. Like, please, who's your best broker? I need, and I was like two years ago, this product was flying. So Again, you never wish, you never root for recessions. Like, dude, it, it's 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 tough. Like, we're battling. We're like, I always equate it to like a fight. Like, we are taking punches, we, but we're landing punches. You know, we're landing. Um, but you know, it, it, we got we got a little swelling under our left eye. My rib hurts. Like, <laughs> when I come out of this, I'm gonna take a couple weeks vacation, no doubt. But um, but no, we're we're doing we're doing well. Um, I. The bigger, the, the public companies, they all got a report. So I know what they do and they're getting smoked right now. Yeah. And the boutiques are, are 12 months from now, there will be boutiques that you know of, that I know of, that will not be in existence. And we're already seeing it. I've already heard of in the last 90 days, three boutique companies that didn't pay their brokers on closing. So they're like, hey, mm. just give me a couple months. We're just a little tight. And I'll tell you why that is. Gets back to Matthew's growth. Is like in a good market, every boutique makes money. Yeah, and then what does the owner do? They sweep that cash. Yeah, they're like, okay, like, what is my payroll? It's uh, you know, it's five hundred grand. All right, great. I'll leave five hundred grand for the next twelve months. But it made two million. Like, okay, I'm gonna take that million and have and go buy real estate. I'm gonna go uh, buy that big home. I'm fund my kids five twenty nine. Like, good things. I'm gonna give it to charity. Awesome things. But then when the market turns, they don't have a lot of cash in there, and then they start bleeding. What are you gonna do? You're gonna do a capital call. Like you're going to go like, you're going to go to your investors, say, Hey, fund this business. And they're like, where'd the money go? You're going to go to your broker and say, Hey, I need to lower splits. That ain't happening. No, no way. Not in the down so market. You know, you know what they do? They start pulling massive resources. They start letting marketing people go and transaction management analysts. And you see every public company who has to announce they, they've all publicly said, Hey, we're, we've cutting 400 million in overhead. And it's like, that's what you're, those are human beings. Like, where did all the money go? You guys made so much money over the last couple of years. Where'd it go? Shareholders. Okay, fine. That's the public world. Okay. What about the boutiques? They swept it. Yeah. And now they're getting smashed and they're about to break. They're about to tap out. No moss. Like they don't want any more of this. And we get those phone calls. All right, buddy. Thanks for having me. This was fun. This is great. Thanks yeah. for coming on. No, thanks. I, uh, I just, I think like, I don't do a lot of these. I think I got to do more is what they tell me, but, um, now you do a great job. No, it's, it's good. Well, you know, it's I'm a eat. fan. Likewise, buddy. And I want to do a deal with y'all. Yeah. Hey, listen, I wanna do- you could sell a deal through us anytime. All right. Okay. Right now. Let's, uh, let's, let's go grab lunch. We'll talk about what deal you want to sell. All right. All right.